So what are some of the worst problems facing uh, not only the federal government or the state governments, but just the country in general? How about our society? We're going to talk about some of those issues, but more importantly, more importantly, we're going to talk a little bit, a little bit about what the government has already tried to do to address these issues or perhaps caused these issues. And we're going to talk about the things that you can do on an individual level. Like what is not only the conservative approach from like a political standpoint, like what do our policies look like versus their policies, but even more important than that, what can we do as like-minded people to actually deal with these problems and actually create real solutions which don't require anything from the government. No political activity whatsoever. We're going to discuss all of that and more on today's episode, Powered by Good Ranchers. Thank you so much for joining us. If you were with us on Tuesday during the live stream, we, you know we had technical difficulties. I uploaded the full episode on the MTA channel, so if you'd like to finish that episode, you can go over there and click on the videos tab and find it. We would love to have you watch the rest of the episode because it was a lot of fun. If you haven't already, go down to the link in the description and join our community chat. We would love to meet you there and get to know you as well. And I also want to apologize for the technical difficulties last time. I want all of our audience to know that we, immediately following that episode, we pushed Hamilton into a closet, put a bunch of pennies in a sock, and just beat him relentlessly to make sure terrible. to make sure that he knows that uh, this podcast will not tolerate failure. Well, once again, I am your host, Nick Freitas, and if I avoid prosecution, <laughs> I will continue to be your host. However, with us today is not my beautiful bride, Tina, Queen of the Bees. She actually has some... Uh, Important duty she has to get to today, and she wasn't able to be here. At least that's what she told me. Let's hope she hasn't left me forever and will, in fact, be back next episode. And then, of course, we have our Scholar of Doom. Is that what we're going with, Scholar of Doom? Our <laughs> resident historian, political prognosticator, Christian Hines. How are you, Christian? We're, we're going to try to give people something to be a little bit optimistic on. Well, that uh, was certainly the today. way to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we're talking about some deep stuff today. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I went through, when I um, when I built this outline with you, we went through and we, we identified, I think, around 10 major issues that, quite frankly, are, are ignored within the political sphere, which is very funny because I would argue the political sphere created all 10 of them. Well, I, what, what I thought was most interesting is when we were going through this outline at the very end, when we were talking about, all right, how are we going to, how are we going to talk about the solutions here? Christian was the one where it's like, well, we've got to be really, we got to be really focused on making sure that, you know, people don't get black pilled. And we're like, wait, what, what did Christian just say? <laughs> So it's encouraging. It's encouraging. Yeah. We're all we're all bringing him along and making him a, a, a happier human being, the, theoretically. And then, of course, our producer of producers for now. We'll see how this episode goes. Nicholas Hamilton, <laughs> I, I, the I good said, Hamilton. I said, I said a prayer that we did not have any technical difficulties. <laughs> so uh, hopefully, no closet today for me. All right, good. Yeah, yeah. No, no pennies in the sock. That uh, those things hurt, man. I'll yeah. tell you what. You, it's just a simple tool. Oh, if, I know. I if they ever take it. our guns away, I'm I'm definitely going for the pennies in the sock because that'll that'll certainly. I don't know, change the way someone thinks about a particular issue. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about some of the issues, and we're going to focus on uh, the economic side, but we're also going to talk about some of the social and cultural issues as well. But we need to define our terms. We need to, we need to lay out um, some of the issues that we've talked about in greater detail in the past. The, the whole point of this portion is not to do a deep dive into everything. It's just to talk about some of the issues that pretty much everyone across the board, left, right, middle, whatever, all agrees that, yeah, these are, these are issues, right? These are, these are things confronting our nation. So let's look at, let's look at one of this uh, first one here. And this is something that we've, we've talked a lot about with respect to inflation, but specifically the looming sovereign debt crisis. And this is something that Christian likes to discuss. So Christian, explain a little bit for anybody. Maybe this is the first episode they're watching. What do you mean when you say looming sovereign debt crisis? Um, well, there's a particular word that I would want to use, but we try to be a family-friendly podcast. <laughs> um, it starts with an F. <laughs> Um, okay. so just, just get, get that in your mind when I describe yeah. the situation that we're in. So we are, is, is the F word, the fed <laughs> insert? Yes, we are fed. Not, not us. We're, but we're totally <laughs> fed. We've been, we've been, we've been fed. Um, uh, no, it's, it, I, I mean, if you want to use another word of uh, we're, we're, we're totally doomed. So basically we've, we've fed around and we're about to find out. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> we need to. New coffee mug. Yeah, <laughs> there, yeah you, you have that as the text on one side, and then on the other side, you just have this graph. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for our audio listeners, uh, for for 
anybody that's watching us on YouTube, we're going to, you know, we, we've got some graphs, some charts, some headlines that we're going to try to bring up throughout this episode to explain what we mean by each of these, each of these problems that are popping up. But um, for our audio listeners that are only just listening to us, like in the car or at home or wherever, let me try to explain what this graph is that we're pointing at. This is showing the debt, the deficit in the revenue of the federal government over time going back to really the Clinton administration. Yeah. So over 30 years ago. And what you see here is basically the United States' federal government, uh, you know, when it comes to their, their you know, fiscal stability, I mean, it's, it's just fallen off a cliff, especially over the last like 10, 15 years or so, really since the 2008 crash. And so what you see is a very brief era uh, around the turn of the uh, millennium where you had um, what this author calls the dot-com surplus, when, where the federal government briefly ran a budget surplus. And with the exception of that time period, um, the federal government has been running perpetual deficits for what? At this point, like well over 20 years. Yeah. And what you see is administration after administration in both parties, they just rack up the debt. And the thing is, is that the debt doesn't just disappear. It's not just that the deficit is a bad thing. Like when politicians say, see, we cut the deficit. Yeah, but if you haven't eliminated the deficit, that means the debt is still going up every yeah. single year. And it's not just the debt from this year. It's the debt from 15, 20, 30 years ago as well that's being piled on. And so what you end up getting is you have like an exponentially growing curve south as our fiscal situation yeah. deteriorates. This is what I mean by the, the coming sovereign debt crisis because eventually, whenever you lever up, whenever you pile on debt, otherwise known as leverage, there must be a deleveraging moment at some point in the process. The deleveraging moment could potentially come in a positive way. So for example, uh, a, a shrewd investor, I'll, I'll use an example, Michael Burry, the guy that shorted the housing market uh, in the lead up to the 2008 crash and made just an unfathomable amount of money. He levered up in order to make a lot of money. He went to the banks and he like signed these deals where he had these like reverse credit swaps or something like that, where, where he, he loaded up on debt in order for him to short the housing market. He had to pay through the nose in order to do that. And it almost ruined him, but he managed to time it just right that he made a ton of money, but he still needed to take on a bunch of debt in order to make a bunch of money in the process. And so then when the housing market collapsed, he was able to pay that debt off. That's a deleveraging moment. So that's a positive way, not positive for the American economy, of course, but positive yeah. for his bank account. That's a positive way that you can deleverage. But the, the fact is, is that no matter what happens, whenever you take on debt, it must, you must go through a deleveraging at some point. We've not gone through any sort of deleveraging. We just keep leveraging up over and over and over again. And eventually it's going to get to a point where it spills over. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what the federal government wants to do. The deleveraging comes either in the form of record inflation or in the form of a massive credit crunch. And that that's the part that's the part to understand here for everyone that's looking at just in, in like pure layman terms, right? You 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 get your debt up to such a point to where it just dwarfs the revenue you have, the interest that you have to pay on the debt ends up consuming so much of your budget that you're not able to pay for critical things. So if this was a if this was a family budget we were talking about, we're getting to that point where now it's like, okay, well, you can't pay the mortgage on your home anymore, it's going to get repossessed. You can't pay for the car anymore, it gets repossessed. Like, like that, that's where you're, you're approaching. Well, so what does that look like for the federal government when they do it? Well, it comes to a point where how do you pay the police? How do you pay the military? How do you pay Social Security? How do you pay Medicare and Medicaid? Like, how do you pay for all these things that you've promised to people and that, you've, that they've now become in some ways dependent upon, whether it's a, a government program like maybe Social Security or it's the very mechanism that the government uses to enforce laws and impose order, which is the military and, the, and law enforcement. So you've got gotten to a point where, okay, you, you're not bringing in enough in with tax revenue and enough people are not borrowing the gut to, uh, or excuse me, loaning money to the government because they don't see it as a wise investment anymore. That only leads, and this goes to our second point, what's the, what's the final mechanism the government has to try to pay its bills? And that is the printing press, right? That's inflation. And what we're seeing right here, this is, this is our debt chart, but if we look at inflation, it is completely, we, we've been engaged an inflationary monetary policy of, of a significant degree. 
really since the 70s. I mean, and, and now that's ebbed and flowed. There's been other times where it's been a lot more, you know, steady than before. But we need to understand that as soon as Nixon, all right, so it's, well, I'm blaming a Republican. If anybody wants to question whether or not I'm capable of being intellectually honest and consistent. It was a Republican, Richard Nixon, that completely removed us from any vestige of the gold standard and moved us into a purely fiat currency. Now, here's what people need to understand, too, on the left, because a lot of people will try to blame Reagan for this idea that, well, gosh, you know, we had this point in American history where where wages, uh, you know, were, were constantly going up with productivity. And then we had this departure where wages remained kind of flat and productivity was going up. Why weren't why weren't laborers actually experiencing more? There's two reasons for that that we need to address here. One of those reasons is that the government started getting involved and negotiating on behalf of labor. And what did they negotiate? Well, they said things like, you got to have so many days sick leave. You got to have maternity leave. You got to have breaks. You got to have minimum wages. You got. They started doing all of these things that were adding on to what your compensation package looked like. But it was in addition to what you could get paid. So you need to look at this from an employer's perspective. If I only have so much money that I can pay for an employee and the government has required me to set aside certain funds for, you know, sick leave and unemployment and all these other, these, these other factors that actually becomes part of your compensation package. Because from the employer's perspective, I got so much money I can spend on labor. And maybe at one point I could have paid you $20 an hour. But with all these additional government programs that I'm now required to contribute to once I hire you, now I can only afford to pay you, you know, $13 an hour. And so that is necessarily going to cause wages to remain stagnant or go lower than what they would otherwise be if the government has now decided that part of your compensation package is going to include things that you may or may not have wanted, right? They took the power away from you. That's one factor. Another factor is inflationary monetary policy, because as we've talked about ad nauseum here, inflation does not affect everybody in the economy the same way. If you're in the sort of position, if, if with respect to kind of a favored banking status, right, if you're too big to fail, um, when that money hits the marketplace, right, and, and, and it's just printed currency, it interacts differently within the economy than when we're talking about increased productivity, and so what ends up happening is the people that are on a fixed income, they're the ones that are most vulnerable to an inflationary economy. The people that are on like a set wage scale, they're the ones that are most vulnerable to an inflationary economy because they're not moving around assets, right? They got their paycheck, but their paycheck doesn't buy what it did last year or the year before, the year before that. And so all of a sudden they find themselves where they're in an economically disadvantaged position while the people that did have the money and the know-how and the access were able to move their funds around to make sure that they put their stuff in things that were, were better during an inflationary economy. And so what does that do? It causes massive differentials between this side, right? Like the, the people on the fixed income are working for like steady wages versus the, the, um, a lot of the people that, you know, are able to invest, Right? They're, they're able to move assets around and continue to gain money and make money during an inflationary economy where everybody else who typically would have been able to save or maybe do some modest investment find themselves in a horribly disadvantaged position. This is one of the reasons why Milton Friedman always referred to inflation as a hidden tax because it's taxing savings. It's taxing the money that you have. So th those are two of the reasons why we see this increase of productivity taking place. It's, it's not because the government didn't do something. It's because the government did do stuff. All right. So that was inflation. Uh, that also kind of explains some of the growing income inequality. Do you want to hit how it also affects some of the unaffordable housing? Um, actually, I, I, before I jump into that, or maybe as a lead up into that, I, I want to talk about the, the growing income inequality a little bit more because sure. there's a fantastic website. Um, Hamilton, it's the, I believe it's the next link that I've, uh, that I sent you. Um, actually, no, this is talking about uh, the inflation component of it. Yeah. So this chart is actually from the Federal Reserve, and this is showing the money supply over time. Um, Take a guess <laughs> when the pandemic took place on this chart. Hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at that, uh, that, that massive 90-degree angle that took you place. You mean the massive hockey stick yeah. moment yeah. or it was like in one year the money supply jumped like 25%? 
Yeah. Like, it was almost like $3 trillion was printed overnight. So so for, for me to explain this for our audio listeners, this is a chart showing the money supply. It's, it's actually from the Federal Reserve. You can go to their own website and you can find this. And what you see is, I mean, first off, a steady march northward since the 70s. Um, we're going to get to that in a second. Why does this keep seeming to pop up in the 70s? Um, you see the steady march northward since the 70s in terms of the money supply. And then you see a big jump post-2008. And it's, again, an even steeper climb northwards from 2008 onwards. But then this this little thing out of China came along in 2020. And um, are we allowed to say that? The thing that shall not be named? Yeah, the thing that shall not be named. And then it's just a complete hockey stick jump upwards. Yeah. Um, and you see... The, the federal uh, the Federal Reserve's attempts to combat inflation, you see this little tiny dip yeah. uh, since then. By the way, the uh, the spike at the very end right there, that is uh, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, and they needed to bail out all those investors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because apparently that, I mean, it's- It works every time, right? Yeah, they don't, they don't- times it never works. I never got a bailout, um, but, you know, apparently if you're super well-connected, you, you can. Um, there's- one more chart that I wanted to show, and this is uh, not that- <laughs> 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 um, uh, Hamilton, go to the go to the next. Oh, so it wasn't the next tab. Uh, let me see here. This is yes, this yeah. is it. Scroll down. This is the purchasing power oh, yeah, of the US gosh, dollar this over is, time. Uh, okay, audience, was say right now, this is about to make you angry. <laughs> okay, so again, I'm going to explain it for our audio listeners. This is a chart. It's actually a fantastic. It's a beautiful chart. It's from uh, I think Visual Capitalist, and uh, this show it's uh, this shows the purchasing power of a dollar since the establishment of the Federal Reserve in 1913. So what, about 110 years now? And what you see is that really the, the equivalent of a dollar in 1913 is, is like pennies today, mm -hmm. like j just a few pennies today. Um, so for example, if you were to travel back in time, it, it shows you like all the different types of things that you could purchase in the past. Like for example, in the 1930s, you could buy 10 bottles of beer if we hadn't gone through massive amounts of inflation since then, your mm -hmm. purchasing power has been eroded so much that, you know, today you can barely buy, you know, a, a can of soda yeah. for $1. But back in the 1930s, you could buy, you know, not just multiple cans of soda, you could buy multiple bottles of beer for the equivalent of $1. So basically what it's showing is just a complete collapse in the purchasing power of the dollar. And what you see is, again, since the 1970s, just a complete erosion of the the purchasing power. I mean, it was getting bad before then, mm -hmm. um, but since the seventies, the bottom has fallen out. And so, where does this lead us? Why does this keep popping up in the seventies? And this is the final point that we're going to get to um, before we we move on to the 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 housing component of this. There's this fantastic website called WTF Happened in 1971. Hamilton, it's the next tab. And the, I just recommend everybody who's watching this, or if you're if you're driving or you're just listening, when you get a chance, go take a look at this website. Again, it's WTFHappenedIn1971.com. This is a fantastic website, and it, it's just a compilation of graphs and charts. And yet, for some reason, all these charts seem to be going wrong or going haywire all at the same exact time in the early 1970s. And so one of these charts is this is the difference between compensation and productivity going back from 1948 to 2017. And what you see is a tight correlation between compensation and productivity all the way up until 1972. And then they diverge rapidly and compensation lags far behind, basically doesn't go anywhere since 1972. This is why you've probably heard the phrase before, you know, it seems like wages have been stagnant for decades. Yeah. Well, there's a reason why. Hamilton, if you keep scrolling down, there's a few more that I want to get to. There, we have no ability to go through all of them because there's like over 100 of them. But there's a couple in particular. Um, if you keep going down, here's one. Uh, you know, income gains have been wi uh, widely shared since uh, um, the end of World War II, but not since the 1970s. So what you see is the top 5% have seen massive growth in their income, whereas the bottom 20%, they've gone almost nowhere in the last 50 years. And the median has barely moved at all. So what you've seen since the 70s is a, a massive growth in income inequality. Um, obviously, you know, there's always been income inequality, right? Mm -hmm. But you, you, historically, though, 
Somebody in the bottom 20% and somebody in the top 20%, yes, they had different levels of income, but they both saw that income grow relatively at the same pace all the way up until the 1970s. And then you see this divergence where it's people at the bottom rungs of the ladder have have grown almost nothing at all in 50 years. And the, the wealthiest people in this country have seen massive returns since then. This is fed into a lot of socialist talking points. Yeah. The, 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 the left loves to talk about this. But what they don't like to talk about is when did this really start to become an issue? Because they want to pretend it started in the 80s under Reagan. And that is not when this started. It started in the 70s when we actually separated from the gold standard altogether. Oh, you spoiled it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You want to talk about... I didn't realize you were building the, up to that. <laughs> I've talked enough on on what the problem is or leading up to the problem. Do you want to go into detail about why this is such a huge issue? Well, so yeah, one of the big things that I, I think frustrates conservatives and advocates of free markets is this idea that the left comes and says, see, here's your beloved free markets and how it actually treats you know laborers and everything. And we're, we're saying, wait a second, th- there's a reason why laborers in socialist countries risk life and limb and get on leaky rafts to try to make it to the United States. Don't feed me this line that, you know, capitalism fails labor, like socialism fails labor every single where it's tried, but they can point to something like this and people really feel this right. And, and a lot of the charts and a lot of data back up this superficial claim they're making, which is just purely a representation on the chart. This is going up, this is staying flat or going down. And then they're offering you capitalism as the villain. The problem is, is that doesn't make sense with what we see across history, across time and across countries. So something else needs to explain what's going on here. And again, when they try to start the narrative in the 80s, it's easy to blame Reagan, Reaganomics, all those other things. But when you actually look at that, the major departure starting in the early 70s under Nixon, that's when you have to start to ask the question, okay, what significant thing happened there? And that was a complete removal from any vestige of the gold standard. Now, keep in mind, the gold standard in in 1971 was was not, you know, I can go to the bank and hand them a dollar and they'll give me a dollar's worth of gold, right? That's not what was going on. Um, it, It was, but there was still some sort of system that didn't allow governments to just arbitrarily print as much fiat currency as they wanted without there being international consequences and currency exchanges, right? So there was something that limited the printing press that went away in 1971, right? And then that's where we see this massive departure. And that's what we were explaining before. Not everyone is affected equally under inflationary monetary policy. People that are well positioned to benefit, which is to say that when the money is printed, they get it first and spend or invest it first. They have a bunch more money to buy up existing assets. It's the process of buying up those existing assets without increased productivity that all of a sudden causes everything to increase, all the prices go up across the board. And the end result is people that are working like, you know, just regular wages and things like that. They just can't buy as much anymore. So it's inflationary monetary policy, which is, I would argue the largest contributor to what we're seeing with income inequality. Now, again, income inequality is the natural state of, of existence. Anybody that's want to tell you like, well, the real problem is income inequality doesn't understand how the world works in the first place and how it will always work, right? If you actually wanted income equality, you would say, okay, fine. The doctor makes the same as the janitor. Well, those two things are not equally valuable within society. They may both have value, but they don't have the same value with respect to what people want to buy or what they need to buy. So it's not income inequality that's the problem. What's the real problem is when the government artificially manipulates the economy in such a way as to disadvantage certain people to the benefit of other people. And that's what's going on. The government created the problem they're now complaining about and offering themselves as the solution to solve through what? More socialist policies. like. Okay, great. Show me the country where socialist policies have actually led. And and again, when we say socialism, what do we mean? We mean the abolition of the private ownership of the means of production. Socialism is not, well, we just want everyone to have a, a, a good life and a housing and clothing and medical. That's not socialism. Those are just objectives. Socialism is a very specific political process and economic process, which says that you know, factories, railways, like it can't be owned privately. It has to be owned by quote, the people, which always ends up manifesting itself and being owned by the state. And there is not a single socialist country 
in existence or has ever been tried that has worked out really well for the laborers, right? And that's evidenced by the fact that, again, laborers in those countries always try to fight, you know, tooth and claw to get to countries which are not socialist. So we, we've talked about looming sovereign debt crisis. We've talked about inflation. We've co- talked about growing income inequality. Um, you know what this leads to is yeah. it, it actually leads to the next point. But but to, to sum up the, the analogy, when the government prints trillions upon trillions of dollars and injects it into things like the stock market, the end result of that is BlackRock gets a bunch of money that they can use to buy up a lot of houses yep. and you get record high cost for eggs at the grocery store. Yep. And that actually leads me to um, the next point. On yeah, let me, one, let me one jump question. in with okay. a question right quick. Yeah. Uh, this one is from Insomniac Software Developer on the MTA channel. Do you think some politicians think businesses have infinite money because the U.S. government can spend money like it is infinite? I, I So I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, I have talked to people on the left who have literally said, well, of course we can raise taxes on the rich because they'll just continue to produce. They'll just continue. They're, they're driven. They're just going to continue to do it. And this is, this is how we fund the programs to help other people. And, and I looked at my, I said, you honestly don't believe there's a point where you can tax people or you can regulate them to where they, they stop being at least as productive. And he's like, no, no, I know people like this. They're just going to, con- I mean, they, they, this is just what they enjoy doing and they're going to do it. They're just driven. And I'm like, okay, well, first of all, I think you're wrong. And history has demonstrated that. Like, for instance, when France instituted a wealth tax, they actually saw, I think it was something like 41 millionaires leave the country and take a lot of that investment capital with them. That's why they, a lot of these countries that instituted wealth taxes later on got rid of them. Secondly, that's a pretty morally... I mean, devious way to look at the world. It's like, I know you'll continue to produce no matter what I do to you. So I'm just going to keep doing it to you. <laughs> like, gosh, dang, man, oh. that's, that's a pretty dark way to look at the world. So I, I do think there's some people that their, their conception of the way wealth is created is somewhat perverted because their entire experience has been the government pays them to be a college professor, right? Or at least, you know, pays them indirectly. And then the government pays them to be a politician. And they kind of assume that, well, this is all just a question of how we're going to distribute wealth, right? There is wealth. Wealth just exists. And now we're going to distribute it more equitably instead of asking the much harder question, which is how does wealth, poverty is the natural state of mankind. Scarcity is the natural state of, of, of humankind. How is wealth actually created? And then how do we foster that as opposed to a bunch of politicians just sitting there greedily asking themselves how they can be the ones to, to distribute it? All right. Let's All go. Right. Do you want to so go to the unaffordable a, housing? There's a, there's a few more. So I, I, I um, as, as I said earlier, like, you know, when the federal government prints a lot of money, yeah. you know, one of the things that you see, like, like here, here, here's another analogy. Amazon stock has gone up 3,850% since the 2008 crash. Have your earnings gone up 3,850%? Yeah. So like th- there's ample evidence out there. And and I'm not even, I mean, I, I used a few platitudes, but if you actually want to do like rigorous academic research, there's even that out there that shows that quantitative easing, the, the, the federal government or the Federal Reserve, you know, fiddling with the money supply, fiddling with interest rates, disproportionately benefits those who are usually very politically connected and already wealthy at the expense of everybody else who gets the inflation. Well, can, and can one we... of the problems that that's led to is on the housing supply side, where the housing market is, is it, it's not even that the housing market has a problem. It's that there is no housing market anymore. Yeah. Like, like the number of homes for sale right now is at like basically an all-time low. And the reason why is because everybody's locked into a 2% mortgage rate and they oh, don't yeah. want to sell. And those who do want to buy, they can't afford anyway because how on earth can they afford? We just, it was a few days ago that it was just announced that mortgage rates are at the highest level in well over 20 years, the whole century so far. Yeah, it's over 7% right now on average. So, so you're right. Like I'm, I'm right now, um, I have one, um, I have a house that it's like I locked in at around a 3% and trying to sell that property to be able to buy a different one is incredibly difficult. And you're sitting there looking at what your, your monthly mortgage rate is going to be when your interest rate is doubled. That's significant. That prices you out of significant portions of the marketplace that you weren't priced out of four years ago. Uh, but to Christian's point, when that money goes to BlackRock first, and, and here's what people need to understand about the way inflation affects the way people spend money. If you are an investor, if you, if you have enough money to invest and you get a bunch of money in an inflationary economy, you know what's the first thing you do? Get rid of it. 
because you know the value of that dollar is going to be decreasing over time. So what do you buy? You buy assets that can actually appreciate over time. So if you're buying Amazon, if you're looking at Amazon as well, this is like one of the most, you know, disruptive, like, you know, successful companies, that's where I'm going to put my money. So of course, Amazon benefits from an inflationary monetary policy, because if I got a bunch of money, I'm, I, I got to get it out of dollars and I got to get into something right away. And that's why you see people buying up real estate, buying, buying up in the stock market, doing all these other things. So the people that benefit from those industries can actually do better in an inflationary marketplace. Everyone else who's in a position where when I get money, I got to buy groceries or if I'm going to buy a house, I have to sell mine first to buy this one because I can't afford to just buy property. You're the ones that are getting trashed by this deal, not BlackRock. Yeah. Who benefits the most from an inflationary economy? Politician, government, politicians. And, and I would say probably the banking industry, the ultra wealthy in general, because they yeah. usually are, are the ones that get access to the the free printed money before anybody else. No. I mean, I, Again, consider the fact that like when the country was shut down in 2020, the stock market was reaching all time highs, yeah, which is nuts. at the same time that we literally shut the economy down. It, 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 like that was proof right there. You know, the whole efficient market hypothesis that that was the whole proof right there that the market was completely disconnected from the reality of the day to day economy because mm -hmm. like we weren't producing anything. People weren't shopping. People weren't buying. And yet prices on shares of the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ were, were hitting all-time highs almost every other week and month. Yeah. On on the housing side, I want to talk about this briefly because this is, I think, the second to last point on the economic yeah, let's, side. Let's do, we're going to do that. I'm, I want to just let everybody know because we're people are getting blackpilled, Christian. So we're going to get into the economics. We're going to get yeah. into some of the social stuff. And I promise you, I promise you, we are getting to solutions. Go so, ahead. So um, on the housing supply side, um, this is a chart showing how inflation has has basically just made housing completely unaffordable for people. So um, the chart says inflation causing hardship for majority of U.S. households. Share of U.S. adults saying that price increases have caused financial hardship for them by household income. And what you see is that since 2021 to 2022, all households, you've seen a massive jump almost, uh, over 10 percent in terms of, of difficulty to actually make ends meet. Um, Hamilton, if you go to some of the other tabs, we've got, um, I, I, I sent a few things about the state of the housing market as, um, in general, um, and it's back. Nope. Not up there. <laughs> See, this is why I told you guys that we needed to have all the tabs open before we started recording. Yeah, right, go ahead, just um, no, it's fine. Um, Hamilton, if you want, I can, I can resend it and just send you the, um, I, I actually, sure, sure. I sent you, um, uh, What's the name a, of it? a direct message. It's right beneath the the link to WTF happened in 1971. Okay. Um, there's a, there's a there's a couple links there. One one was a Fox Business article. Um, yep, this is it. If you scroll up to the top, we just there want the headline yeah. here. Uh, U.S. housing affordability at an all time low. Um, so I mean that it says it right there. I mean, if, if you actually scroll, you know, it's more difficult than ever, ever to buy a house in the U.S. There's another um, there's another link that I sent that's right beneath this that I think kind of illustrates this in terms of a, a graphic format of just how hard it is to buy a house. I'm in the market to try to buy a house right now. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, there's just nothing available that I can afford. And I make pretty decent money, too. I just can't afford anything. Um, this is an interesting article. Um, how the Fed destroyed the U.S. housing market. Um, if you scroll down, it shows a few a few graphs here that are just insane. So like housing prices adjusted for inflation and, and traditional growth in, in housing prices. What this is showing is that housing affordability is at a worse point now than at the peak of the housing bubble in 2006. Yeah. I mean, that anybody who lived through that. I mean, we're in a worse situation now than we were at the height of the housing bubble. Well, and this is, and, and again, inflation, inflation affects so much of this. And one of, one of the questions that people ask is like, well, what can you possibly do about inflation? And again, some of it's beyond your control, but I'll tell you one thing that is not beyond your control with respect to inflation. And that is, if you go to Good Ranchers, 
<laughs> I promise this is going to actually apply to inflation. If you go to Good Ranchers now, they actually have a deal because this is something, and we talked to Ben Spell about this. They actually have a deal on Good Ranchers where if you go into one of the subscriptions, you can get locked into the same price of that subscription for, what is it, two years? Two years. Two years. You think about how prices have fluctuated so much over time. This is one of those areas where Good Ranchers realize, you know what, we can provide a benefit to our customers by saying, you lock in right now with this subscription, we're going to give you consistency with respect to the prices that you're going to pay. We're going to give you some sort of dependability with respect to your grocery budget. Not to mention the fact that if you use the promo code Nick, right, and you want to support the show and support what we're doing, support what we're talking about, promo code Nick is going to give you $25 off your order, plus it's going to give you free shipping. And if you sign up for one of these subscriptions, which allows you to lock into price, you're going to get two free pounds of their quality ground beef as well. So every month, every month for two years, for two years. Think about this people. This is, this is again, we got a quality product with a quality company that recognizes how their customers have actually been affected by things that the federal reserve is doing. And they've decided that we're going to come up, we're going to come up with a plan that actually gives our customers consistency and quality and dependability over time. And you know what? I think that's, I think that's worth supporting. So Good ranchers, go in there, look at the promo code, get a good deal on some of the most quality, you know, meat products you, you're you're just ever going to experience. They're really, really good, and we thank Good Ranchers for supporting the show. K Karen on the MTA channel just left a comment and said that she got her box of chicken yesterday, and it was great. Yeah, that's one thing that was that's one thing that Ben Spell was actually talking about. Is a lot of people show up for the steak. But then they end up really liking the chicken because they actually have genuine, like when you hear organic chicken, what that really means in most places in the marketplace is, you know, they they were allowed to, to live. They were allowed to go outside. <laughs> they were allowed to go outside and walk around three feet, and then they got organic feed. And what people are imagining is chickens, you know, going on family vacations and living a great life. And that's that's not the case in most cases. But when you look at the way Good Ranchers does it, they do have a quality product, and it actually shows in the way it tastes. So. All right. Um, it, it is, you know, I mean, personally, I like the chicken more as well. So, I mean, mostly because I like buffalo chicken mac. Yeah. Um, we're almost done with the dooming, though, um, <laughs> for the audience. I, I, I just want to want to let people know. And then when we're done with the dooming on the economic side, we're going to we're going to talk about some potential solutions. And then we're going to do some more dooming. And then we're going to talk about more solutions on more of the cultural and domestic side. So, um. I there there's there's I think like one or two more points that I want to get to on the economic side before we talk about all right let's do those the, quick let's go yep. to some of the cultural and then we'll get to the solutions and, you know it's it's actually funny there's a good ranchers <laughs> app right there yeah. um so this is an article from Reuters titled uh, U S credit card debt tops one trillion dollars overall consumer debt little changed yeah little changed from an all time high this actually came out at the beginning of this month so this is a relatively new uh new story and basically. If you actually look in, also the Federal Reserve has graphs on this as well. It's interesting how they have all these graphs about the the a absolute state of how terrible things are when you look at like a macroeconomic or financial perspective in this country right now. Americans are drowning in debt. It's not just the federal government. It's, mm -hmm. it's people as well. For some reason, I think that inflation created this thing called the wealth effect. Um, every, almost everybody suffers from this. And the wealth effect is when you see your assets go up in price or go up in value. So, you know, you've got your, like your Robin hood app yeah. or something like that. I know I went through this when the, the GameStop squeeze happened. And when I shorted the uh, treasury market last October, um, I felt like I was super rich, but the problem is, is that when it crashes for a lot of people, basically, Okay, how, how do I say this? When when your assets go up, you increase your spending because you feel richer. So you're looking at your little app or you're looking at your Bitcoin or something like that. And you're like, oh, it's at an all-time high. I'm a lot richer. I can go and spend a lot more money and live a more luxurious lifestyle. But then when the burst happens and the bubble deflates, for a lot of people, they're unwilling to cut back on spending, spending that was very recent in order to, to pull back from that more luxurious lifestyle that they were living just a few months or years ago. And so what they do is, in order to fill the void, is they use credit. Yeah. They use debt in order to fill the void. And so that has created a well, it's, circumstance. It's difficult for people to reach a certain level of income, and then all of a sudden inflation wipes out a portion of it or something else happens, and then to to have to retrench and completely reorganize one's lifestyle. It almost feels... It almost feels unjust, and in a case where the government has actually facilitated that happening beyond your control, it is unjust, right? Like, you have a right to feel unjust about it, but 
taking on credit card debt is actually a horrible. So where does to, this all lead us? Yeah. So the the you know what I'm, this is kind of an inside joke, but I'm going to tell the audience this. When I was uh, uh, working with Nick on the outline for this episode last night, I told Nick my final point under the economic section is. Uh, in, in quote, um, the, the future is Argentina. <laughs> um, that is, I think, the best way to describe the economic state of things. And what I mean by that is, is that in Argentina right now, it's, it's really interesting what they're going through in a terrible, you know, horrible way. Um, they've got like interest rates are over 100 percent. Inflation is over 100 percent. The Argentinian peso is basically utterly worthless. Unemployment is like double digits. It's like 20 or 30 percent. Um, the economy in Argentina has completely disintegrated. Yeah. It's it's basically a first world country that has third world problems right now when you look at it from a macroeconomic standpoint. So that's the summing up of the black pill, right? I mean, we've gone through everything from income inequality to inflation, QE, housing prices. I mean, you name it, the, the debt, the looming sovereign debt crisis. It seems like from a macroeconomic standpoint or just a general financial standpoint, things are really, really bad right well, now. And it's, so let's talk about the solutions. Well, I think it's, I mean, the, the one other thing we need to kind of get to, because I, I want to, I wanted, <laughs> let's get all the black pill stuff out of the way before we get into the solutions. Otherwise, going back and forth, there's just going to be a problem. We all acknowledge that this is this has led to a collapse in trust in a lot of institutions. It, it's going into like a growing like friendship recession. Like it's actually amazing the number of. Oh wait, you actually want to jump into the cultural stuff too? I, I want to get let, let's let's do both of this and let, let's just like railroad ahead to like solutions. All right, then if if we're gonna go through that Hamilton, we've got a few more links. Um, I I thought that it would. Um, let's Hamilton, um, Hamilton go. Yeah. If if, if you go Next to the. Link. So we're going to go, this All is right, the historically so is low faith in one. U.S. Yeah. This is from Gallup. If yeah. you scroll down, you'll see um, that basically trust in institutions has has just completely collapsed. It's reached an all-time low. And this actually sorts it by category. So what you see here is that like Congress, I mean, yeah. the, the, the joke from Congressman Tim Burchett when we did our UFO episode is he thinks that more people believe in UFOs than believe in Congress. And he's right. <laughs> um it's not just that big business t TV news. That's a huge component of it. The criminal justice system, yeah. newspapers, organized labor, large technology com uh, companies, the presidency, public schools, banks, the U.S. Supreme Court, the church and organized religion, the medical system, the yeah. police. Every, Every single everything. one of those institutions that I just listed, under 50% confidence right now. And then yeah. the final two are the military and small businesses. Those are the only two institutions that Gallup polled that have over over half of the American public say that they have in, any confidence in. Yeah. So what you've seen is just a complete collapse in confidence in all of the public and private institutions that make up American society. That's the first point. Yeah. Uh, now, let's Nick, go you want to go through the next one? Yeah. Go I thought this was hilarious. One. Oh man. New York times. Well, it's okay. I've got a backup one. Yeah. The, here we go. It, it's not just, it's not just your friendships really are worse now and it's getting harder to make new ones. So yeah, this comes from fortune magazine. Go ahead and scroll down. The, the, the whole gist of this is that more and more people are finding themselves in a situation. We keep running into these ad blockers. They, they, they're finding themselves in a situation where it's really, really difficult to, again, maintain strong friendships. Now, Obviously, I think COVID kind of contributed to this with with massive lockdowns. Like if you had a family around you, that was one thing. But th I think about all the people. And I think this is tough for some of the people in our audience because I think we do have a lot of people that are, have families. If, if you were a single guy or a single woman during COVID, you were by yourself. I mean, the, the only interaction that you were getting in a lot of cases was on social media over Zoom or things like that. And, and I think we can all agree that technology provides some advantages with respect to communication, but it is not the same as actually fostering close relationships with people that you can actually interact with at the same physical location. And, and we're, we're starting to see that. I think technology is part of it. I don't think it's the whole story, though. I think another part of this has to do with just this, this idea, like the kind of the cultural... Uh, the cultural norms have changed so much to where it, it used to be that when you were interacting with somebody, you kind of knew that both people were bringing maybe certain biases or past experiences into the equation. But what we've had lately is this constant drumbeat of what are your pronouns and what do you identify as? And are you an oppressor or an oppressed? And even if that doesn't come out as, as like blatant as it, as it, 
you know, sometimes does in the most extreme cases, there's still this underlying tone. And you actually see this in race relations as well. And that's the next one. Ratings of black-white relations at new lows. I mean, we, we were... We had had this steady progression over decades of of people b- becoming far more um, you know the, the the range of friendships they had with people beyond someone that might have been of their own race or from their own um, you know like tight knit community and then expanding out and just the the general you know acceptance of of that sort of differences was all moving in a very very positive direction. And lately, it, it's it's one of those things where I honestly believe more and more people have become somewhat cautious. Like if you're a college student right now, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you probably wouldn't have thought twice about going into a particular area and sitting down and talking with people that didn't look like you and learning about their experiences. And now you could walk into that same space and be asked to leave because of your skin color. Well, even if you haven't experienced that personally, if you've watched that, you're thinking in the back of your mind now whenever you see somebody like, well, is that is that how they think of me? Do they see me as an oppressor? How do I go about not not being an oppressor? Is it is there any way for me to do it? You know, can can we effectively interact or form friendships like you are adding a whole host of questions into the equation now, which based off of the articles that we're seeing have led people to think, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's worth my time. Or I don't know if this people would if, would this person even want to be friends with me since I'm a horrible oppressor and there's nothing I can do about it except try to be an ally and even that doesn't absolve me of of you know the the damage that was done decades before I was born uh, and so these things don't foster greater race relations in fact they they cause more animosity to be injected into it and we're seeing that in the way that people actually interact. Um, we're also seeing the destruction of the family and collapsing birth rates. Um, yeah, that that's one that that I, I, that we should talk about briefly because, like, Elon Musk is warned about this a lot. Yeah. I don't think that people are are prepared to. I, I posted this in Circle too, a, a a chart showing that it's not just like Western Europe or Japan that's seeing a collapse in birth rates. It's like the whole entire world, other than Africa, right now. Yeah, and. That I don't I don't think that people understand just how bad it can be to live in a place where the population is shrinking. If you want to if you want a clue on just how bad it could be, go to Detroit. Yeah. Or go or alternatively, because Detroit is an extreme example, you can go to the Great Plains. Yeah. The western part of the Great Plains. If you go to any counties in like Kansas or Nebraska that are to the west of like Kansas City or Omaha, all those counties have been shrinking since the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. And they're just deserted landscapes deserted buildings and houses there's less jobs worse infrastructure lowered economic opportunities shrinking populations are bad for society yeah well, in and, general. and it's and it's not hard to see why you're having fewer friendships and fewer marriages and fewer families and, and a rise in mental illness when you look at a chart like this and it says percentage of men across age groups who agree with statements about feminisms rights and anxiety so when it says i'm worried about a partner accusing me of abuse after a sexual encounter the younger you are the more you think of that as being a very very significant possibility we're talking about you know 33 34 percent when they ask the question in America, men have it harder than women. Gen Z and Zillennials think that answer is absolutely true. Like a majority of millennials, Zillennials and Gen Z all believe that feminism has made in America, America a better place. Gen Z, the youngest group of men, you know, it is under 50% that actually believe that is true. And it's because if you start to look at, we did a whole episode on why men are leaving the dating pool. It, if you have a, a whole sector of the population, essentially half the population, right, men, but then the youngest men believing that they are at a complete disadvantage and there's no way they can escape it, and then you have other people that believe that I, I'm just a horrible person now because of my skin color or because I'm, you know, you know, I, I'm heteronormative or whatever new terms they're coming up with today. Of course, you're going to have less acceptance, less interaction, less friendship. Um, we see this well as a doctor or other healthcare provider ever told you that you have a mental health condition. This is insane. This is nuts. Walk the audio listeners through this chart. So when uh, you look, no. I'm going to start with, okay, has a doctor or other healthcare provider ever told you you have a mental health condition? And this is the percentage of people that say yes. White conservatives, 18 years old, 
27% of females say yes, 16% of males say yes, right? 30 to 49, it's 26% of females, 7.8% of white conservative males. Now we move to moderates. Right? I'm going to say relatively with the, low numbers for conservatives. Rel- relatively low numbers for conservatives. Although you notice a growing problem with younger people. Still. Yes, yeah, it's definitely much higher with younger than it is with older people. Now we move into moderates, people that associate as moderates. White moderates, 18 percent or 18 to 29, 28 percent. So pretty similar, pretty similar with respect to women among 18 and 29 year olds within moderates and conservatives. But you see a big uptick in males. 18 to 29 year old white males, it's 20, it goes from 16% to 22%. This is in the moderate category. This is in the moderate category. You see the same thing with 30 to 49. And, and, and again, 30 year old white conservatives, 26% of the females said, yes, I've been diagnosed with a mental health condition. It's 32% for white moderates, right? 7.8% of 30 to 49 white male conservatives, mental health, 20.1%. For white male moderate Huge gender gap in ideology for men there. Now let's get to liberals. This is where it just flies off the rails. This is where it's crazy. So I'm going to, again, just give everyone context. If you are an 18 year, if you're an 18 to 29 year old female white conservative uh, or moderate, there was about a 27.5% chance you had been diagnosed with a mental health issue. If you're a white liberal woman, 18 to 29, 56.3% chance you have been diagnosed by a doctor with a mental health condition. Well over a majority. Well over, I mean, that's like almost double the other numbers for the other ideologies. 18 to 29 year old white liberal men, 33.6%. That's compared, that's compared to an average between conservatives and moderates of about 15%. 15%. White liberal men who are 18 to 29 have a higher mental health, you know, or, or, or more, I, let me rephrase that, more white liberal men age 18 to 29 have a mental health problem than any other category, men or woman by age of the other two ideologies, yeah. conservative or moderate, yeah. including women for that, for that oh, matter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, th- this is a not third. If you identify, if and and again, before anybody starts saying like, oh, well, the memes write themselves here. I I actually have um, I actually have a significant concern with this because it would be very easy to mock this and be like, oh, we all knew it; they were crazy. Go back. This is tragic. Um, and, and, and here's what I think it indicates, because this is the last thing that we're going to talk about before we go into the solutions. When we talked about all the economic problems, why is it that housing is so expensive? Why is it that inflation is so high? Why is it that we see this massive uh, you know, income inequality gap that, that really is causing genuine problems that are, that are not just part of a, a larger social narrative by socialists? And then what, what do we point to? We say, well, once again, it's government intervention. It's government policy. It's government that's creating the inflation. You're not inflating the currency. The government's doing that. You're not the one that encouraged rapid government expansion of, of spending. I mean, you might have voted for it, right? But the government is the one that is doing that. The government is the one that is creating the very conditions that they then offer themselves as the solution. The point of this is they're not just doing this in the economy. They're doing this socially. These numbers spiking with respect to mental health, these numbers spiking with respect to out-of-wedlock births, this was not the norm in American history. This is fairly recent, and you can chart it back to other government programs which started to incentivize these things. You're telling me, you're telling me that when a white liberal woman is over twice as likely to have mental health issues as a white conservative woman, that that has nothing to do with the culture that they have found themselves immersed in, that they tended, that they have adopted for the purpose of explaining the issues that they're dealing with. Is it working? Are they better off? Is, Is it a good thing that over half of white liberal women have been diagnosed with a mental health condition and have the solutions that the left has offered to those mental health conditions made them happier? I mean, that tells me right there the complete failure of third wave feminism because it's the youngest 
we're, we're talking about the youngest demographic here. When, when you look at older generations, 65 up or 50 to 64, I, I mean, even even 50 to 64, the left still has a mental health problem oh, it's, more it's three than times. moderates or conservatives. But yeah. when you get to like the 65 plus category, it's again, still the left has a bigger problem, but it's relatively low across the board. What you see is across the board in fact there's there's another chart that i think shows this in a visual component that might be a little bit easier for our youtube listeners to understand this shows the same thing broken down by age and also by gender and by by ideology and what you see here is just across the board people on the left are are the ones that are going through this massive mental health crisis which is very interesting because i think conservatives tend to be a little increasingly people like me they tend to be a lot more doomer ask black pilled ask mm. but we're more black pilled about you know the stock market or the bubbles the everything bubble or inflation or you know sovereign debt crisis that's looming we we tend conservatives tend to be very black pilled about things related to politics and economics yeah but they're not at all very black pilled when it comes to things about like family or religion or me finding meaning and purpose in life. The left, I think, is black pilled about everything. Well, what? And I, I think I think with this, I think what this really comes down to, and and this this came out. We were on the Sean Ryan show a while back, and that that episode's going to come out here, uh, I think, in a couple months or so. But I'll give you a little sneak peek into it because one of the questions he asked me was, "How do you deconstruct a nation?" And the answer that I gave, and I won't elaborate because I want you to watch that show, but the answer I gave was, is you have to give it an identity crisis. Which side of this spectrum from conservative to liberal is dealing with a massive identity crisis? Because here's what is so critical, and this leads us right into the solutions section. It's not that conservatives are growing up in a different country than liberals are. It's not as if inflation is just naturally affecting us differently. It's not as if we're not frustrated with what's going on. In fact, in fact, conservatives are the ones that should feel the most isolated from their culture right now when you look at the dominant narratives within media, academia, politics, and Hollywood. They're not reinforcing our beliefs. They're reinforcing the liberals' beliefs. So why is it we don't have the identity crisis? And it's... Be Quick question for you. So, sorry, I interrupted you. Finish. <laughs> like I was about to land it right there, man. Sorry. I was about to land it right there. And, I, and I, I honestly believe it's because we don't get our identity from the same things that they're trying to get their identity from. When you buy into this postmodernist narrative that there is no absolute truth, there is no God, there is no, you know, family is, is a representation of a patriarchal system designed to, to, keep you, to keep you down and oppress you, and marriage is the same thing, and there is no logic, there is no reason, it's all about meta narratives and it's all about lived experience. Your, your feet are firmly planted in nothing. And then what do they do is they offer themselves, well, the movement is what's going to provide you meaning. You don't have any individual identity, it's your group identity. That's what's going to give you meaning. And conservatives over here going, no, no, no. I'm a husband. I'm a wife. I'm, I'm, a, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm Jewish. I'm whatever it is. Like, I, I, know who my, I know who my God is. I know who my spouse is. I know who my kids are. I know what my friends are. I, we know what we believe. We know what we have to do as far as working hard and things like that. And these things might frustrate us. They might make us angry. They might cause us to some course of action, but they don't challenge who we are. And if you know who you are first, and again, I get my identity in Christ. Nothing shakes that. Nothing shakes it. So when all the problems come up, those are things I have to contend with, but they don't change the nature of my being. And I don't think they have that. And so this leads us off to, well, well Hamilton, first of all. No, no, I apologize for interrupting. That was great. <laughs> um, uh, so I would like to go to one of my friends who's a therapist and ask him this question of why is it that the left has far more mental health issues than the right? And I think what he would come back and say is that, oh, liberals are far more aware of mental health issues. And I would like to hear what your thoughts on that would be. How, how's their awareness helping them deal with it? <laughs> Seriously. I mean, th this is one of the questions. Like, we, we always talk about we need more awareness. We need more awareness. We need more openness. We need more discussion. Can I honestly say something right now? Actually, I think we need less. 
right? I, I think that this hyper awareness of turning everything into trauma, there are things that are legitimate trauma that need to be dealt with. And the people that have experienced that trauma need to have a safe mechanism where they can actually work through that. I absolutely believe that. But when you create, when, when you turn everything into some sort of life altering trauma, for which not only you have to contend with, but everyone around you and all of society is also required to contend with it. Has that made things better? Are the people that believe that and have been pushing it for the last seven decades feeling better about the progress they've made? Because again, this problem didn't start yesterday. We're, we're talking, there's 65 plus on here, right? The, the 65 plus liberals still had a higher degree of, of mental health conditions than the 65 plus conservatives, and moderates. And moderates. So so again, the idea was is that over time, you would have thought with their gradual control of in institutions and industries and everything else, this number would have gotten better over time. That's the thing that blows my mind. We were talking last night uh, about all these terms that people independently have tried to come up with to describe the same phenomenon. Yeah. Some people call it the system. Andrew Tate calls it the matrix. Yeah. Curtis Yarvin and some of the neo-reactionary people have called it the cathedral. We've called it on this podcast before the Leviathan. What we mean by that, and I, this is actually crucially important to understand some of these problems. When people talk about, when we talk about the Leviathan, or when some people on the internet talk about the cathedral or the matrix or whatever it is, what they mean is, the institutions outside of the control of the federal or state government that the left has engaged in ideological capture over. Mm -hmm. So what we refer to there, here's what I mean. Have you ever wondered how weird it is that the New York Times, Cal Berkeley, and BlackRock all believe and parrot the same exact thing? <laughs> yeah. The faculty of Berkeley yeah. and the managing board of most, you know, S and P five hundred companies, yeah. and most of the editorial boards of the major newspapers or news outlets in this country, they all believe the same thing. Yeah, and they're not government, and they're officials. all parroting the same thing, and nobody's yeah. telling them to do anything. It's not directed. It's not a conspiracy. That's the thing. A lot of people think this is a conspiracy theory. No, it's actually the opposite of a conspiracy theory. There is no centrally coordinated mechanism for any of this. Nobody's telling these people to parrot the same thing. They all genuinely believe the same thing. That's the that's what the Leviathan is. That's what the cathedral is. It's the media. It's academia. It's the arts. It's Hollywood. It's Silicon Valley. It's Wall Street. It's all the major yeah. news outlets in this country. All of these things working together, all pushing the well, same and, narrative now, and listen, message. Listen, I think we need to distinguish things. That doesn't mean that everybody in Wall Street, everybody in the industry, everybody. What we're saying is that those people that do, and it is a significant portion. But the, the, the way I describe the Leviathan is that it's not just government. It's not just, you know, it's not just Hollywood. It's not this. It, it's it's people that have, I, I would argue that many of them are dealing with the same identity crisis, and now they've gotten their identity within this ideological movement, which is rooted in progressivism, in critical theory, and, and that is what they use to try to make sense of their lives and make sense of the world that they see around them. And that not only comes with a sense of security, you better believe it comes with obligations that they must do and incantations they must repeat in order to you know, remain the correct in, opinion in order to remain in good standing <laughs> with the Leviathan or else it will eat them. Right. So that's where we're at. And this leads us, this leads us as we go into so what do we do about it? And and the one thing that frustrates a lot of people is when and and it Christian, I, I love your quote on this, and I'm giving you full credit for it. But Christian is like, you can't just tell people, go out and vote harder. <laughs> like, you know, if you're living in California right now, maybe you should move. But if you're living in California right now, you are you don't honestly believe you're going to be able to change the trajectory of California by, by going out and losing the next gubernatorial election by 15 points. Right? So you're looking for, okay, if I can't move, if I can't afford to move, what do I do to contend with the economics and the culture that I find myself immersed in. And that's where we're going to get into next. I, I think that you started, uh, this is going to be my favorite part of the podcast, actually, because we've talked, we've done so many episodes where we've talked about the problems independently. We've done episodes independently about economics. We've done episodes about, about um, you know, the, the complete collapse of, you know, relationship building and the dating market. We've done episodes about um, all sorts of these different problems independently. And in this episode, what we tried to do was compile them all together and explain, here's where the problem is. And now we get to talk about the solutions. And I think that you hinted at the very beginning of this conversation a, a few minutes ago, what one of the what one of the biggest solutions is, 
And you know what? I would argue that this has been a solution that's been around for thousands of years. The Greek philosopher Socrates once said, know thyself. Yeah. I think that conservatives know themselves. I think to some degree, moderates also somewhat know themselves, although I, I would argue that they don't have as strong of, of an attachment to some of these non-government institutions mm-hmm. as conservatives They have do. a lot more faith in what government... And I, and I, wanna, I actually want to get to a story to illustrate that point. Do you want to do it right say. now or do you want... Yeah, let's do it right now. Okay, because um, I was going to say the left does not know themselves. No, they don't. They, they derive meaning and purpose through the state. Yeah. So I, I, was, <laughs> I, I, was, I was on a plane recently... Um, and it was funny cause the, the guy had asked me, he goes, Hey, are, are you Nick Freitas? And I, and I said, yeah, cause that's, that's usually, it means one of two things. Uh, usually they either kind of like me or they kind of don't. Right. And, um, and, and he didn't know me from coffee. Mike, he said, yeah, you came to my house, uh, when you were campaigning we actually had a long conversation. Do you remember it? And, and he described, I said, yeah, it was long driveway. You had a big tree, you know, as we, we sat out there and talked for like 30 minutes and the guy I was with was like, Nick, we got to go. He's like, yeah, that's it. I said, okay. And, and we proceeded to talk for the whole plane ride and very intelligent guy. Um, and very willing to have just a, a good civic conversation. Right. And, and he would definitely fall within this moderate category. I think he still has a, a real sense. He has a very sense of identity with respect to being a husband, with respect to being a father and, and wanting the best for them. And, and the, the big hang up that we had, and this is what I think distinguishes, this is where the battle is, right? Because if you're, if you're a hardcore liberal that has 47 pronouns in your, your Twitter bio, I'm probably not convincing you of anything anytime soon in, until maybe you reach that point where everything that you 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 built up your life to give it meaning collapses because it will like this is this is not going to be able to sustain them forever but this was someone that was like well look i'm i'm a lot more comfortable with with government action than you are and and i said okay that's fair and we started to talk about a whole host of issues and it was a wonderful conversation and he brought up good points and he was willing to listen to my points and one of the things that that ended up being so meaningful to me in that conversation was this idea of getting beyond this concept that, oh, well, there's a problem. Of course, of course, there's some sort of government approach to deal with this problem. And, and he could certainly recognize where government had screwed up, but he was more inclined to believe that, well, maybe that's because the government didn't pick the right solution or didn't have the right people. Whereas I was making the argument that, or maybe they just weren't suited to the task, right? That, that's an incredibly important thing that conservatives need to remember. If you're honestly expecting for all of this to be solved by the next presidential cycle or even the next four presidential cycles, we're also forgetting that the government isn't suited to some of these tasks. And the most important issue, this identity crisis issue, is not going to be answered by the next presidential election. It's going to be answered by people once finding their identity in things that are true and provide them a sense of purpose and meaning and consistency, intellectual consistency, emotional consistency, spiritual spiritual consistency. And the reason why that is so important is because what I said before, you're going to encounter problems in this life, right? That's coming. Read Ecclesiastes, right? Solomon, the richest, wisest guy on the planet wrote a whole book, which is quite frankly, pretty depressing. (laughs) Uh, But he talks about vanity of vanities and all these things. But if you're, if you're secure in who you are, and this is the part where, again, you don't need any permission. This is not determined by the next election cycle. But if you're secure in who you are as a position and where you get your identity and the source of that meaning and purpose, and you actually place it in something that is true and, and can stand the test of time, then when again, when the challenge presents itself, you see it for what it is, a challenge in an imperfect world that you are going to have to contend with, but there's actually benefits to it, right? Not, not every challenge is, oh, woe is me. Wouldn't my life be better if this challenge didn't exist? I, I, I can't stand it now when I see people on the left say things like, oh, I'm a wage slave because I'm not truly free because I have to work to eat. I'm like, I got news for you. That, that's not capitalism imposing something on you. That's called reality. And it's been here forever. And it will be here in the future because there are certain conditions to living. But when, you, when you're secure in who you are and your meaning and your purpose, you see a lot of those conditions as opportunities and, and you don't see them as just purely problems, which must be overcome by a government program in order to achieve, you know, equity or justice. So that's, that's the first thing that I would tell people is, you know, again, find that thing that is, you know, that is you mean, securing your identity first. You mean you wouldn't tell people that the, the number, the first solution that you need to solve these problems is, is elect better people. Yeah. The, the, so, <laughs> 
better people to do what? Like, so, it, it, so this was actually something that Mike Pence got dragged on for the debate last night. I didn't watch the whole thing, but I did see some clips. And yeah. one of the the lines that Pence had, it was a canned line that, you know, his his advisors told him to say was, you know, the American people are already good. And, and you know, we've already solved all of our problems ourselves. We need to just elect political leaders that are as good as our people. <laughs> and Vivek actually pushed back on that. It yeah. was basically like, you're giving a morning in America speech, but Mike, it's not morning in America right yeah. now. If he was able to point to to some of these charts and graphs and headlines that we've talked about in this episode so far, he would have made that point even stronger because yeah. I think that people understand that deep down inside there's something something has gone horribly wrong. Something has gone wrong. And the question is, how are you going to fix that problem? The the number one point that I want people to to walk away from this conversation learning is that nobody is coming to save you, least of all politicians. politicians. Yeah. Well, so the one thing I would push back on this, and then I want to get to the comment from Jim Ross because it, it's actually spot on with what we're talking about. I would argue, I would argue theologically, somebody already did come to save you. No human <laughs> being is coming to save you. But I would, I would, even, I would even say, that, but, but can I say this? Like, I don't even think that's entirely true. I think it's absolutely true that, yeah, you shouldn't be waiting on the government to come and save you. But what is so what is so amazing, because the first step is is figuring out that identity component. And before I go into that, I want to read Jim Ross's thing, because I think it's a problem. He goes, the basic problem is the disguising of control by changing the meaning of words and language. By shifting what common terms mean, everyone is cross-talking because the same words mean different things to different groups. Classic description of the problems with deconstructionism. When you accept this idea that words have no objective meaning, they're only given meaning by the hearer or the listener, well then, okay, well then why would you bother to write that? Or did you just hope I would interpret it the way that the author intended? Like, how stupid. But he's right. People adopt this and they selectively apply it for when it works for their argument and then they abandon it when it doesn't. And it creates confusion. And in the midst of confusion, you can't have effective communication. And a lack of effective communication leads to isolation and resentment and misunderstanding and eventually violence. So the first thing is get your crap together as an individual. And, and part of that is understanding what is what forms the foundation of your worldview. How do you interpret the reality around you? Now, again, I think Christianity does, gives the best explanation possible for the human condition. I think it does that. Now, some people get upset, like, why do you focus? Because it, I believe it's to be true. I'm going to tell you what I think is true. Because it, I, Not just because I've studied it, but I've lived this. But it's that idea of, of understanding the foundation of your worldview. What are the mechanisms you use to make sense of the world? And mine starts with God. And on, on top of that, I have the meaning and purpose with respect to um, you know, being a husband, being a father, just being a man in general and, and understanding, okay, what are the responsibilities there? Okay. Well, I, I have to protect and provide Well, the left says, well, that's a traditional gender role. I don't care. I don't care. They say that like it's a bad yeah, thing. Yeah. I don't care that you think that that's a traditional good. I think it's a good traditional gender role because I know that in order for me to be the sort of man, if, if that's, that's how that's a core component of my identity, right? Created by God to be a man, to be a protector provider. What do I got to do to be able to protect and provide? I've got to develop skills and capabilities. And, and some of those skills and capabilities are physical. I should be able to fight, right? I should be able to work. I should have stamina. I should, I should be able to think. What do I use to think? Well, I've got to develop an understanding of how to properly interpret the world, the laws of logic, reason, the scientific method. All of these things do a great job of helping me interpret reality in effective ways to achieve positive outcomes. And also to avoid mental illness, because I would yes, I would so argue true. I would argue that I, I'm going to get like really nerdy here for a second. I will argue that the left has fallen for a modern atheistic form still, but a, a modern form of Gnosticism. Yeah. Where... There is some sort of secret truth that that's impossible to grasp, but th you know, there it, it's on the the tip of their fingers. But in their pursuit of of going after this, they've completely lost touch with reality. Yeah, and and that that's basically what what many of the Gnostics, you know, the ancient Gnostics were were trying to talk about was is a lot of them would, would twist things like Buddhism or Christianity or any any ancient religion, yeah. but especially Christianity, in order to try to argue that there is some sort of like secret unknowable truth that we have access to, but. 
in, in pursuit of this, and James Lindsay talks about this a lot, in, in, in pursuit of this, what they've created is an, an atheistic religion that, that provides no meaning or purpose. Or no redemption. And no redemption time. and no grasp on reality itself. No. And so it, there's no, there should be no surprise. Hamilton, pull up that chart again showing the, the huge spike in mental illness among people on the left. I, Nick said something earlier when where he he, he was yeah. talking about, you know, I should, as a man, be able to do X, Y, and Z, and then the left will come back and say, but those are traditional gender roles. They say that like it's a bad thing, but you know what? Them booing that means nothing because I see what makes them yeah. cheer. Yes. Yeah, oh, I love that. Yeah. Your boos mean nothing. I've seen what makes you I'm cheer. I'm not going to get life advice yeah. from the most mentally ill elements of society. I'm the, sorry. And I don't say that like 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 I'm I don't say that like I do not sympathize with people that are suffering from mental illness. But you know what? I'm not going to be taking life advice and I'm certainly not going to be taking philosophical or political advice that could affect 330 million Americans no. from the most mentally ill, confused, deranged unhappy. elements, unhappy elements of society. If anything, we should be looking at the people in the moderate and conservative category that are the most happy and most content with life and understand that's where you can find meaning and purpose from. Maybe at, for, for once, maybe ask your grandparents mm -hmm. what made them happy, what gave them a happy life. Ask people that you know that are living a fulfilled life what what gave them that fulfillment? What made them happy? For many people, it's religion. For for many other people, Jordan Peterson talks about this a lot. This is the thing that makes Jordan Peterson popular. It's finding responsibility in the world, finding something that can give you meaning and purpose. And you find meaning and purpose through responsibility. For men, that's a huge component. But you know what? It also applies for women. I, I would argue, and it's very controversial for a young man to argue this, but I'm going to argue it anyway. I would argue that the modern feminist trope of telling young women that having children and getting married is an act of oppression is the the worst piece of advice that could have possibly been given to some of these young women that are now yeah. in the liberal category, almost 60% of them dealing with a mental illness. Yeah. Well, professor Responsibility is not just a, a something for men. It's for everybody. Oh, of course. Uh, professor Keene said, get your, he, in quotes, he goes, get your crap together. Well said, but Jordan Peters said it, already said that years ago, although I would love to see you and him on your show together. Yes, yeah, so would I. Um, yeah, I, I, think I like a lot of what Jordan Peterson has to say, but I, I think that one of the things that Peterson has done that has also been important is he doesn't just say get your crap together. It's also what's the formula, and that's kind of what we're trying to step through right now. S solidify your worldview. Solidify your worldview, understand that, and then start start to look beyond that. Like, okay, again, for me, created by God, I'm a man. A man has certain responsibilities. I need to provide. I need to protect. I need to develop skills and attributes and capabilities in order to effectively do those things with respect to how I think, with respect to how I act, with respect to how I interact, right? And that's where you develop, again, your 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 reasoning capability. That's where you develop your physical capabilities. That's where you develop your professional capabilities. Um, one of the things that we had a great talk with John Lovell about, which we're going to, we're going to put out here in a little bit was this conversation too, with respect to men, we're not just supposed to be the warriors. We're, we're also supposed to be in the, in the terminology he used. We're also supposed to be the poets. There's supposed to be a, a romantic side as well as, as the masculine, as well as the, um, the, the warrior protector provider side and that, that both of that is is inherent within masculinity. Yes, I should be a threat to the people that are a threat to my family, but I should also be able to display tenderness and, and availability to my wife, to my children. And and so, okay, what do I need to develop to do that? And and this is why this is important. I don't, again, out of what I've just mentioned, this is the most this is the most fundamental aspect of what it means to give your life identity, meaning, and purpose, and it has nothing to do with politics. The, these are all the things that you have to develop to help you inform your political decisions, sure, but they're they're informing a whole bunch of other things as well. Did you have uh... just a few things? Um, one, I want to thank Jim Ross for the super chat. Yeah. Absolutely. Two, I think Christian is pushing back against this Doomer title. Because yeah. that was very encouraging. I like that. And three, I have a question from Rocky Top Tom here. Yeah. If conservative means to adhere to the traditions of and stand by the institutions in society, what then does conservative become when those institutions preach the opposite of traditional belief? 
So th- this is a this that is, is a great it's a great question. question. It's a great question, and and this is where you kind of get into arguments too about like Burkean conservatism and, and what does it mean to be a conservative. I I think you also have to talk about conservative within certain traditions, certain intellectual traditions. Um, pol- philosophical traditions to give you an idea of that is obviously if, if conservatism is nothing more than to conserve that which was done in the past, right? Well then, okay, the stuff that's been done in the immediate past is, is that what we have an obligation to conserve now? I no, of course not. Con- conservative has taken on kind of a colloquial meaning, but I would argue that as we look at American conservatism and what that, what that generally means is that we value certain ideologies, certain philosophies with respect to government, with respect to markets, with respect to individuals and society kind of that were present at the American founding. Now, obviously that doesn't include things like slavery, right? That doesn't include things like denying women the vote. And we should also not be conserving the Leviathan. No, we should be killing and slaying the Leviathan. (laughs) It's about the idea that if you look at the deck, I think the declaration of independence is actually very, very informative on this because even though the declaration didn't form the United States government, right? That's the constitution. It, it heavily influenced the philosophy that would be taken into it. And so that was this idea that, you know, again, in that preamble, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That whole concept in 1776 was truly revolutionary. And so when you ask me, what am I trying to conserve? I'm trying to conserve that foundational philosophical principle with respect to what constitutes what the United States is supposed to be. It is essentially an ideal And so there's certain institutions that we put in place in order to protect those ideals. My job as a conservative is to protect for and fight for those institutions, those traditions, which uplift that underlying philosophy. Insofar as an institution becomes a threat to it or a tradition becomes a threat to it or is contradictory to it, I don't have any obligation to conserve that simply because it came before. It's it's what are those things which serve to to elevate this idea that your rights come from God, that they're not just granted to you by government, that you have inherent rights as a result of this, and that you should be able to pursue happiness to the extent that you define it insofar as it's not infringing on the rights of other people to do the same. Right. Those are those are underlying principles which inform our government. Now, I would argue that I'm also trying to conserve those principles, or ideas and institutions, which I believe are good for humanity and also serve to achieve those things. So even though I might not want the government imposing certain rules or religious mores on you, I, I don't want to do that. I will still advocate for certain traditions and religious mores, which I think are beneficial for society. But I will always do so in a paradigm of voluntary cooperation rather than imposed coercion or coercive imposition, I should say. Former uh, Wokey White, thanks for the super chat. He says, when I was left wing, I was depressed. Now I am conservative, right winger. I am happier. Leftists live with constant world catastrophes and can't be happy. I, I, Which is so crazy because, again, we've I've, I, I've brought up the phrase before, the Leviathan. Like, they control all of the institutions and almost every single institution that you could possibly think of has, has gone through left wing ideological capture in this country. They control everything. And yet, they're the least happy, most mentally ill group in this country. It, but you know what? I think that that actually speaks to a really deep truth, which is that raw political power does not grant you meaning, purpose, and happiness. Yeah, It, it, it simply would, doesn't. When, when you try to define all of society by like oppressor and oppressed, and then you've concluded that it's, it's getting out of the oppressor category to ostensibly, I guess, being the, or, or out of the oppressed category, um, or, or achieving that through political ends, that that's going to make you happy. What we see is that, no, it doesn't. You simply, you simply look for some sort of new oppression to, to combat. And so, again... The revolution will never end. No, no. And again, <laughs> lay, laying out this thing, set up your worldview, understand who you are and your identity and your purpose, and then start developing the capabilities that you're responsible for developing to be able to achieve those aims. And, and this is the part, too, where that's all... What we've talked about there was all the individual right? It's all the, what are your individual responsibilities? And then we start talking about not just the rights, but the responsibilities and the obligations that come with them when you start entering into community. And that first community that you enter into is family. This is a huge, I mean, this is huge because I think Jordan Peterson got a lot of attention when he talked about responsibility, but 
I'll be honest, as conservatives, you have a responsibility, not just as an individual. This is part of the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm not really a libertarian. I used to identify as one. Nick knows this. When I was a lot younger, I used to identify as a libertarian, but I don't anymore. Yeah. And I think part of the reason why is because your responsibility doesn't end with yourself. Do I have libertarian leanings? Absolutely. Huge fan of the Austrian school, for example, yeah. right? Huge fan of individual liberty in general. But Individual liberty cannot be separated from responsibility and not just personal responsibility, but responsibility for your family and your community. There, it, there are components of that, that if you don't fulfill those things, people will notice. And, and I think that we're living in a society right now where quite frankly, for so long, there has been no responsibility towards things like family or community. And, and now many of these institutions are, were kind of running on inertia where they, they needed stable families and stable communities in order to operate functionally, in order to operate properly. But you ignore those two things for so many decades and eventually the wheels start to fall off the bus. And so I think that Peterson is in the right, right mold here when he come, you know, when he talks about finding responsibility, but it doesn't end with your own individual responsibility, like clean your room or go get a job or, you know, <laughs> brush your teeth and take a shower, get out of bed, th those type of things. I think that the responsibility component is much broader than just that. How do you be responsible for yourself? It's also, how do you be responsible for your family? How do you be responsible for, for society as a whole? And I, I don't think that that responsibility comes about through, well, let's just pass a bunch of laws and mandate the responsibility. Mm -hmm. No, it, we're talking about responsibility outside the confines of government because i know that when the left talks about responsibilities what they're really saying is i've got a gun and i'm pointing it at you and i passed the law saying you have to do something or else we're going to find you or throw you in prison that's not at all what we mean as conservatives when we talk about responsibility to your family or to your community or to your country yeah hn 784 says you spent your entire career in government you trash it bizarre but typical of right wingers you know what i find is interesting about that is this idea that if, if you've been associated with something and you see the problems with it and you want to correct those problems within it then you're you're automatically a hypocrite if, if i had served in government um with the intention of of carrying out all of the policies that I've trashed, that would certainly be hypocritical. But if I've served in government with the purpose of ensuring that government doesn't do things that I don't think it should do, that's simply a mechanism for trying to correct an institution from within the institution, which is, is actually a fairly common approach. You know, if, if the moment you don't like something a school is teaching, do you just leave the school? If the moment you don't like something that's happening at a, at, at a business you're working with, do you just leave the business? Well, in certain circumstances, you may. But in other circumstances, when you still believe that something is worth saving, you will try to fight to try to correct it. And so that's that's the thing I would say is the difference. But let's go back to the second category. So the first I've got, ca I've got a meme that I, I, I want Hamilton to pull up. Hamilton, okay. I just sent it to you. Okay. I think this encapsulates this mindset. I've heard so many people bring yeah. this up before. Nick is a politician, and before that, he served in the military. He's been working with government his whole <laughs> life. How dare he bring up these things, the hypocrisy of the right? Yeah. You know what? This encapsulates, this mindset encapsulates exactly what this guy was saying. Here's the meme for the audio listeners. You've probably seen it before. The the peasant working in the fields. We should improve society somewhat. And then the guy is like, and yet you participate in society. Curious. I'm very intelligent. <laughs> Here, here's the thing. Here's And again, I'm not trying to insult the person that said this. I'm just trying to point out that there is a distinction between w working within something in order to try to correct things that you think are deficient versus just being a hypocrite. Um, now, here's the thing I want to point. So we talked about the first one is like setting up, working on the, the obligations that you have as an individual just by virtue of being an individual, just by existing. And then you start to look at the things that you have obligation wise with respect to community. So why do we enter into community in the first place? Well, I would argue that we've been, you know, created to be social creatures, but, and, and I think there's a, there's a lot of value that can come from that, but there's obviously a lot of hostility and violence and negativity that can also come from social interactions. And so one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves first is, okay, why do we do that? Why do we risk it? And, and what we find is we risk it because the values, the benefits associated with going out and, and fostering friendship and fostering family and fostering economic transactions outweigh the costs of doing so in most cases. The concern that we have right now is that more and more people who are who feel that they're they're unable to be economically successful or unable to be socially uh, um successful leads them to greater isolation. And that can be a very, very dangerous place to be. So I would argue that the, the next thing that you're working on that again, requires no government interaction is 
how am I fostering the sort of skills that actually make me effective within social life? And some of that starts with the individual of like learning how to think, how to effectively, you know, uh, uh, express your ideas, how to bring value to other people and how to be able to effectively receive value for them, whether it's in a transaction or something else. But once you once you start to enter into the social realm, right, whether it's with family, whether it's with friends, whether it's economically, we, we recognize that you actually get a lot more value from being able to be a, a producer in that environment rather than just a consumer, Right. If you're the sort of person, I'm like, what do we think of the person who takes advantage of their family or who is always the friend that never, never wants to help pick up the tab or always left their wallet or, you know, is always there to go, you know, you know, hang out with you when you're paying, but is, is never reciprocating. We don't think of that person as a, as a friend. We don't think of him as a productive family member. We think of him as a mooch. Uh, they're, they're a drag. We, we think of them as, as just someone that's leeching off of other people. And you don't want to be that, right? You don't want to be that. You want to be the sort of person that engages not just in, in offering things, because this is another core component that I think is really important and people need to understand about social interaction. If you're constantly giving, but you're never able to receive, then somebody else, you're actually going to drive people away. Or the sort of people that you're going to attract are only going to be moochers and leeches. You actually need to be able to foster an environment where you can exchange with other people. There's, I think it was an old Chinese proverb that says that if you give a man a gift you can't repay, you force him to hate you. Um, and if you look at that right now and you look at the attitude that so many people are getting from this kind of one-sided relationship with society where they don't work and they don't take care of their own family and they subsist off of government programs or charity or whatnot, do those people seem really, really happy that they're able to live this lifestyle or do they seem very, very resentful of the people that they're dependent upon? And I would argue that you see growing resentment within that mindset, you don't see growing, you know, um, uh, charity or community. And so a big part of, of being able to interact socially is to be able to find the areas where you can benefit other people. And then when they reciprocate being grateful for it, right? One, the, the, the single, <laughs> the single greatest characteristic attribute, whatever you want to call it, that is missing from so many social interactions is gratitude. We've replaced gratitude with grievance, and the whole idea to the way you're successful within this very, very hostile social interaction is you show up with the most grievance, never with the most gratitude, because gratitude is somehow makes you indebted or makes you privileged or makes you, um, you know, benefiting from the system and the system is bad. But no, that that gratitude is incredible to both receive, to be the beneficiary of it and to also be able to give it to somebody else. Have, have you ever seen, this, this starts off very young in our social interactions. Have you ever seen what happens with a look on, on a kid's face? It could be a sibling. It could be your child. When they worked very, very hard on something, they didn't just throw it together. They worked on it. They thought about it. They worked on it. They put it together. Or maybe they bought it with their own money or whatnot. And now on Christmas, they're giving it to their older brother or sister or they're giving it to their parent and they're sitting there just watching with this complete anticipation of what your reaction is going to be when you open it and they want you to love it so bad, right? And a lot of times when you're a parent and it's a little kid giving you something, maybe it's a picture they drew or something that they put together that, yeah, okay, you know, this, this kind of looks like whatever you're trying to do, but you don't do that in the moment they give it to you, right? You're like, oh my gosh, this is, this is beautiful. Thank you so much. And they just well up inside because at a certain age, they, they were just receiving, 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 receiving. And, and they, they now had an opportunity to give back. And that reaction that you give to them in the moment is absolutely priceless. They will remember that long after they forgot all the stuff you got them. So it's, an, it's important to be able to be able to engage in that in that um, transaction, not just because of the economic benefit as a result, but because of the genuine gratitude that takes place when both people benefit from the results of a relationship or a transaction or whatever else it might be. So fostering those capabilities, you know, first to be able to provide for yourself, then to be able to provide to your family, then be able to provide, you know, again, within the economy in general, th those are all incredible. And again, you don't need permission. But part of what is necessary to do that 
And this is where this is where we have this departure because you see this argument a lot taking place within kind of leftist ideology, especially with the economy. It's always this idea that it's this dog, this this brutal dog eat dog competitive environment where one people one person's benefiting, another person is is suffering as a result. It's all some form of exploitation. No, it isn't. And if that is your interaction, then go somewhere else because that's not healthy. Most, most interaction of what takes place within the economy is cooperative effort to mutual benefit. But if you want to actually be able to engage in mutual benefit, you need to look around at the needs you see and then compare that with the capabilities you have and then stop focusing entirely on, again, if you want to actually get the most for your labor or for what you produce, you have to do so in a mechanism which actually serves the people that you're going to be doing this for. And that's not a bad thing to look at. That's not exploitive. If you think about it, that's, that's an economic system. And this is what you get generally within the free market. You get an economic system which incentivizes you to do an excellent job providing for the needs of other people in exchange for the things that they provide that meet your needs. And when that transaction takes place, it, it's not exploited and exploiter. It's I valued what you were giving me more than I valued the thing that I was giving you and vice versa. And the end result is both people are better off as a result of the transaction. Nobody was made poorer. Both people were made wealthier. That's critical. Like understanding that nature of how free markets work and then being able to position yourself to be able to do that. Now, we, we have so the individual responsibilities, the community responsibilities, and now we talk about the you idea. You want to talk about like the institution? I want to talk about the institutions, and I want to have kind of a conversation. I really want the audience's participation in this for looking at the institutions we have and asking one of two questions Do you save it or do you set up an alternative? So, as we look at the institutions that, that have for centuries now in the United States kind of shaped what we think about who we are, not as an, not necessarily as an individual or a member as a family, but have, have really shaped now who we are as a country and as a people. What are, let's identify those institutions and let's ask the question, do we save it by working from within or do we say it doesn't work for us anymore and we need an alternative? Well, let, let's trust that, that when we say we need an alternative, what we mean by that is, is that some institute, some institutions must be saved. Some institutions have been like, like, for example, our political system. So, yeah. so we've talked about so much that, you know, you're not going to vote your way out of your problem. Yes. That, I, 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 that's not endorsing don't vote. Yeah. Right. Like, like keep fighting the good fight, but don't think that voting is going to solve all these problems. That doesn't mean that we just, oh, well, let's just let a bunch of Kim Jong-uns become, you know, yeah. members so of Congress. So we all agree that when it comes to our political system, we still have to engage and fight for it. Sure, yes, exactly. Because no matter what, there will always be a, I'm sorry, but anarchy it, it will not exist. Even so good, I can, I, can, I can tell HM then, then that's what I'm doing. I'm still trying to save that institution. But... <laughs> Some institutions, I, let's be honest, I'm much more interested in, in preserving individual liberty in the context of, of American politics than I am preserving the New York Times. Yeah, sure. <laughs> right? Like, like that's an example of some institutions when we look at the press. Uh, no, we can, we, can, we can get by without the Washington Post and New York Times. So when we, when, we look at the, when we look at the government as an institution and we look at, okay, what's our individual responsibility to that? Well, obviously there's voting. There's, there's fostering the right sort of candidates that we think accurately represent the worldview we've discussed described and will effectively vote and legislate to that purpose. And then there's actually being that person. There's actually running for that office. So there's, there's, there's three categories where all of us have some degree, some measure of responsibility to be informed as individuals and then to actively participate socially with respect to voting, with respect to making the argument for what we believe, with respect to identifying and supporting the people that we think will do a good job, and with respect to potentially being the person that's going to run for office. Those are all ways that we mm -hmm. interact to essentially try to you know, help improve, save an institution. I, and, and to add to that, I would say that there's actually three categories. There's some institutions that must be saved. There's some inst institutions that you you ignore the fact that the left has controlled those institutions and you build your own. And then there's some institutions that need to be completely torn down. For example, I don't think that we need a replacement to the Federal Reserve. <laughs> Agreed. So, but largely though, when we look at these institutions, that's usually the exception. It's It, it, it gets back to what you were saying that, you know, do we save it? 
or do we build something new? All right, so the, let's look the, at the next one. The, the big thing that I, I want people to walk away from on this topic is that we've talked a lot about the Leviathan, right? There, and, and what I mean by that is all of these institutions that exist outside of government that the left has engaged in ideological capture over, the media, academia, Hollywood, the arts, entertainment, you know, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, the banking system. Again, it's a long list, long, long list. And the left has, has captured all of them. That doesn't mean that, that there's conservatives that don't exist within those. There's many, but their voices are drowned out. Wall, Wall Street is pivot is engaging in ESG type stuff right now. They're not engaging in you know we need to promote you know gun use. So and, no, I, I get that we but we like we've, so we've we've repeated this a lot. What like, I, what I, I the mean, audience gets it. <laughs> what what I mean is is that some institutions, quite frankly, the way that we win is we build counter institutions. So a really good a really good example of this, and I don't think conservatives even realize it yet, but they've done it without even without even realizing it is. Here's an example. My, what my favorite piece of fiction, certainly favorite piece of like sci-fi fantasy, it w for the longest time was Star Wars, and then Kathleen Kennedy and Disney yeah, came along, destroyed it, and completely destroyed it. And after three of the worst movies I've ever seen in my entire life, and yes, I did hate Force Awakens. I know a lot of people actually liked it, but especially in, in the context of what came after it, I definitely hated it. Last Jedi, literally the worst movie of all time until The Rise of Skywalker came out, and then that beat it for the worst movie of all time. Yeah. Two of the worst movies of all time. Anyway, point is, is that I loved Star Wars. I loved it. And then Disney destroyed it and replaced it with, with not just like woke garbage, but like it, it wasn't, the problem wasn't that it was too woke. The problem was, is that it sucked. Yeah. It was terrible writing, terrible dialogue, terrible plot. Everything sucked. And so eventually it got to a point where I just walked away from it. I just yeah. stopped caring. And it, it, I was heartbroken. It was like you were going through a breakup, yeah. right? <laughs> it, was, it was heartbroken. But eventually I got to a point where I was like, I, I, it pains me to say it, but I, I don't care about it anymore. And I walked away and I found other hobbies. That, this is how, this is, it, it is painful to do it. But yeah. in, in the last like three years, especially three, four years, especially there's been so many things that I used to be very interested in and I've, I've walked away from well, it because uh, the, the hobby has been taken over by the left. And so when I say construct new counter institutions, guess what we did as conservatives? We didn't just stop watching movies. We started watching ones that we liked. Yeah. I, I can say right now, like we've had a lot of questions on, on the government thing again, and, and it's it, the questions start to go into the details of what do you do? The first thing that you do is you have to actually find people. Like when you talk about, should we get rid of this agency? Should we get rid of this agency? What about the department of education? What about the budget? What I will say right now, you get rid of nothing unless you actually find candidates that are willing to run, that are willing to do those things, right? You, so th that's always the first step with those things. It's, it's like if you're just voting for people based off of some sort of veiled commitment to conservative ideals, but they're not actually you know, willing to, to get into like some degree of specifics with you on how they would actually achieve those things, that's not a, that, that's not a sufficient candidate, right? So that's what you got to find first, right? Like if, if you're focused on how do we get rid of this, well, you got to have the people that are actually willing to vote that way. I mean, that's step one. It just is. So start there. Start there. Um, when it comes to arts and entertainment, because that's what we're talking about right now, is this something that we, again, the reason why you still have to interact with your government is because the government has the, the, the force to use force against you, aggressive force. And so, yeah, you don't want to completely surrender those institutions because they got a lot of guns and they got a lot of power and you want to compete for it. And you want to compete for it in such a way that turns it into the, the sort of structure you want to see, which, yeah, if it's me, it's a whole lot less federal agencies, right? Someone who's asked, what federal agencies would you get rid of? I said, I think it'd be a shorter list to tell you which ones I'd keep, <laughs> right? So, so that's, that's one. That's on the government side. Moving on to arts and entertainment, I think Christian brings up a really important point. Something as big as Star Wars in, in American culture, um, you, you would think it's too big to fail. And what we've just proved, I think what, is, what has gradually been proven is, no, it wasn't. In the hands of the wrong people, it, was, it could fail. And it had, I didn't even watch the last one. And I remember growing up, because I was born in 79, which was right when like the first Star Wars were, were coming out. 
And I, I was a huge Han Solo fan from the very beginning. I mean, what's not to like about Han Solo? Hates the government, smuggler, free trade advocate, always carried a gun, right? My sort of guy. <laughs> but I, so I, I, always, I always loved it, watched them all. And then when the, the, the prequels came out, I was like, oh, these aren't very good, but they're, they're not horrible. In retrospect, right? they're great. Now, they're great by comparison. But then it was this idea. So what did I start doing? Here's the deal. How bad Catherine Kennedy destroyed Star Wars actually created a different industry on YouTube, you know, in the form of guys like Nerd Roddick and The Critical Drinker. We and, both and, love those channels. And, and I, The Critical Drinker uses a, a lot of, it's not as family friendly. I'll just put it that way. They're a both of, hilarious. A lot of language, but, but Nerd Roddick is a little bit more family friendly. He's still like, you know, edge there. But these guys, this I will sit there. And um, I will listen to their commentary on these movies and what's going on because I find that both entertaining and informative. They're actually speaking to some of the things that I'm seeing and they're doing a great job articulating it and they're doing it in a funny way. So it's entertaining, it's informative, and it provides it, it provides an, an alternative to the stuff that, that Hollywood is currently ramming down my throat. But I used to love, Tina and I used to love when we ever had some like free time to just kind of not do anything. We would we would get a series that we really liked, and maybe we had just been working really hard for like weeks on it. It was like, you know what? We're going to take a Saturday. We're going to make ourselves some food, and we're going to watch five episodes of something. The number of shows we've been able to do that has diminished to almost nothing at this point. And we've gotten to the point where for years we kind of put up with certain aspects of it when it was kind of in the peripheral or they didn't introduce the thing that was driving us nuts until episode six. And now we got to see the next four to see how it ends because we're too invested in the characters. That doesn't happen anymore. The moment we can be in episode four and the moment they say, oh, well, now we're going to have this woke gone done. I shut it off. And this is something I want our audience to know because I don't think they realize it. When you watch YouTube, right? We can see the, the analytics for when people check in, when people check out, you know, what, what motivated them. Was there a certain moment that they just said, I'm done and this makes me mad or whatever? I guarantee you, Netflix, Hulu, all of those guys, you know, sit there and pour over their analytics because it's not like renting a movie from Blockbuster, taking it to your home and watch it. The only analytic they got there is you rented a movie. That's it. And you turn it in, probably not on time and probably not rewound, right? But you turn it in. When, when you're watching streaming, they have all the data. They know when you checked out. I, I almost get like a special glee now where I'm watching something and they start to go woke. And I'm like, I'm mad that I got to shut this off, but I'm glad they know when I did. I want them to know that's why I turned this off. I don't want them to have to wonder. The moment woke was introduced, I exited the building. And that helps inform all of these companies that ultimately at the end of the day still got to make money. That helps them know that when I do, like, they didn't just stop watching because they thought the whole thing sucked. They stopped watching because they thought this part sucked, and it sucked so bad they weren't willing to watch the rest of it. And then what do I do? I go over and I give my time to the, the people that are providing value to me. And that's why YouTube, even though I don't like necessarily YouTube, the governing board of YouTube, they do provide a platform where people that I do enjoy watching, nerd rotic, critical drinker when it comes to analysis of arts and entertainment. But then I, I love watching like these homestead, you know, shows. Like I love watching, you know, Jess and Jeremina from Roots and Refuge. I like watching Melissa K. Norris uh, you know, do stuff on there. I like watching Epic Gardening. And then on the other, like I love the history channels. There is so much good history stuff on YouTube. And then every once in a while when, when Tane and I are like, it's like, and yes, there is the occasional time where we're just going to watch funny cat videos right? <laughs> because it's kind of wholesome and it's almost impossible for them to make it woke. Right. But these are ways that to Christian's point, you're not helpless in this situation. In fact, I would argue as a consumer, because of the, the intricacy of the data that they have, you actually have far more power than you ever did before. You just need to effectively execute it. Just real quick comment. Uh, we have a record number of people watching on Rumble, which is cool. Nice. Rumble also just made a really nice interface update, which is cool as well. Glad to see them improving. Yeah. So I've been spending a little bit more time on Rumble. So. That's another example. By the way, we, we went a lot into the media and, and, and Hollywood um, when we talked about constructing new counter institutions. And by the way, it, it's, it doesn't end with walk away. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it ends with 
don't just walk away, but build something new. So well, look at example, Angel Studios. I was about to say that. Like, I walked away from Star Wars, but I didn't walk away from from you know wanting to to you know watch movies or or or, or anything like that. Like. We watched The Sound of Freedom, and that was a great movie. It was. And I hadn't seen I, – I I used to watch basically every single movie that came out because when I um, was in high school and college, I worked at a movie theater, yeah, so I could yeah. see them for free. Yeah. And then it just got me addicted to movies, and then I just watched them all up until, like, my, mid, my, my mid-20s-ish. But in the last, like, four or five years, I've just st- – I've, I've watched almost no movies. And it's in part because they're, they're all garbage. I've been, and they're to the pushing- movies, I've been to the movies once, I think, in the last three years – can you guess what movie it was? Oh, I'm sorry, twice, because I went to Top Sound Gun. of Freedom. Because I went to Sound of Freedom, so that one. What was the other Top movie? Gun. My guess. Let's ask the audience. You say Top Gun? Top Gun. You say Top Gun. Audience, you got any? Uh, I'll, I'll let the audience weigh in on this a little bit. Real quick, while the audience is responding, I want to read this comment. Uh, uh, if you give a girl an acre said, it's really fun trying to find good kids shows. Uh, gay dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the movie I watched, I, I don't know if I gave it. No, I haven't given up. I'm going to give the audience a little bit more time here. That one movie, other than Sound of Freedom, that I went to go watch at the theaters. I'm not, <laughs> Was uh, it Barbie, Nick? <laughs> wait a second, I'm going to give the audience a little bit of time. to. So, yeah, so we got Top Gun coming in, stuff like that. But, yeah, no, I, I found that there is, um, there is actually far more sources of entertainment now for, for the times that you do just want to hang out and watch something than there ever, there's ever been before. And again, as I'm a history nut, so like Kings and Generals, uh, Invicta, History March. Uh, I love it. What If Alt Hist is, is uh, another channel yeah. we, we really like to watch. We're actually going to be on his podcast. You are, not we. Uh, sorry, you are. <laughs> I'm going to be on his podcast. But, uh, because I think he does just a great job. And, it, and again, it's informative and entertaining. I really enjoy the video editing work. And now that I know that all the work that goes into it, um, all right, so I got, all right, let's look through the list of, <laughs> oh my gosh, let's see what our audience thinks I watched. So they say Top Gun, The Little Mermaid, The Covenant, oh, that would have been a good guess, Barbie with daughter. All right, so Bandit's giving me an out. He's like, oh, you went to see Barbie, but with your daughter, so it's okay. Um, let me see, uh, Barbie, Frozen, Barbie, Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer, Devotion, Jesus Revolution. The movie I saw was John Wick 4. Really? <laughs> Because John Wick has some of the best pistol work I've ever seen in any sort of Hollywood movie. And again, I, I understand, like, I feel a little guilty. The language isn't always great in that. But man, like, I just, I love a good revenge flick. Like, I think one of the best movies ever of all time was, um, oh, that movie with uh, uh, Denzel Washington. Um, oh, gosh, I just went blank on it. But it's the one where he goes into, he's kind of like a former special ops guy, goes into Mexico, becomes a bodyguard. Um, oh, I can't believe I just forgot the name. Is everything yellow when he goes to Mexico? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it kind of is actually. Yeah. I'm so gonna look while he looks this up, I, I want to bring up that we've talked a lot about like, you know, the entertainment industry in Hollywood, but the reason that we've talked so much about this is because it's actually a good model. Man for, on fire. Sorry. Man on fire. Great it's movie. interesting. I'll take a look. Um, yeah. it, it, it's what conservatives did to Hollywood, by the way, Hollywood is like basically on life support right now. Conservatives walked away in mass. After 2020, they, they they just did. In fact, there's been multiple videos from Nerd Erotic. I, I highly recommend his channel if you're interested in the topic. He's He, he uh, lived in San Francisco for many years, worked in the entertainment industry. This was like his passion. He had every reason to be a left-wing, very, very left-wing person. And he noticed that the quality just collapsed because they were they were pushing ideology more than they were pushing good content. And he walked away from it. And now the guy's like, he's basically a libertarian. He's on the right. Um but the reason that we're talking so much about this is because what conservatives did to the media, specifically the entertainment side of it with Hollywood, is a model for what we should be doing with some of these other institutions. So, for example, we walked away and we started building counter institututions. We now watch people mock Hollywood rather than Hollywood itself. <laughs> we yeah. now watch yeah. things that Angel Studios are putting out. Like, like, yeah. like there's, there's stuff out there. I mean, we produce a podcast. At some point, I'm going to make my, I'm going to restart my history podcast yeah. at some point that, that that's what Nick gets to. It's don't just be a consumer, be a producer of good stuff. 
build yeah, these as institutions well. as well. Don't just consume these institutions. And what we did to Hollywood, what conservatives did to Hollywood, where we walked away in mass and we basically, again, Disney's losing money hand over fist. They're losing subscribers. People have walked away from Star Wars as much as it killed me to do it. Yeah. But you know what? We should be doing the same thing with all these other institutions that the left has engaged in ideological capture over, such as education and academia. I'm sorry, but unless you're going into medicine or engineering or something where you absolutely need the degree, you, you we should not be telling people the way that you achieve success in life is go get a four year liberal arts so degree. This is the next because we've got we've got we've got a couple more institutions we need to get to because we're, we're running up on time. It, education is one in general. Education is one in general. Homeschool it comes, your kids. I, like I'm a big fan of. I, well, I'm a big fan of alternatives outside of a government run system. Right. That's what it comes down to. People are like, oh, you're anti public school. I'm not anti the public being educated. I'm anti the government being solely responsible for the administration of your children's education. I, I think I, I'm skeptical of that. Now, I recognize that some that is the predominant option out there for most families. I certainly want to, to the extent possible, be able to fight for ways that they can have more choice within an educational system. But I, I would definitely tell people i think this is i think this is one of the most unique environments for us to push back against institutions uh, whether it be higher education whether it be just you know um, elementary school preschool whatever you know high school like all of those things i think i think we are ripe for an, a revolution in education because the educational systems that we have right now aren't working for our kids and how do you know you know when the very people controlling, especially higher education, you know it's not working. When the same people advocating for higher education, the same people that are advocating for more loans to higher education are also advocating for loan forgiveness. So what they're admitting is they sold you on a product that was more expensive right, than the actual value that they were going to convey to you. Because if it was actually worth what you paid for it, you wouldn't need loan forgiveness. And then what do they come back with? They come back with, oh, well, no, well, your college degree is not just about economics, Nick. It's also about society and making a well-rounded individual. A well-rounded individual pays their own debts, right? A well-rounded individual is not someone that says, I'm so busy becoming a well-rounded individual that I need the plumber to pay for my college degree because I'm busy with the well-roundedness of my individuality. No, <laughs> no, dude. I I'm sorry. I, I got news for you. The plumber's a better person than the person that's racking up college debt that they expect somebody else to pay. Now, this doesn't mean I don't have sympathy for a, a whole generation of students that were told that the way, the way to be economically successful is to go get a college degree. It doesn't matter what it is. Just get a college degree because the stats show that if you have a college degree, you're going to make more money. Well, no, what the stats actually show is that when you're doing things that are highly productive and in demand within the economy, you're going to make more money. That's the fundamental truth. The fundamental truth is not the degree. The fundamental truth is if your labor is in high demand with short supply, you're going to make money. If whatever you're producing is in high demand with short supply, you're going to make money. In some cases, that might require a college degree. But even then, we should ask ourselves a question on why. Because in most cases, the only reason it requires the college degree is because of legal reasons, not because of economic reasons. Like, theoretically, could someone not learn how to be a vet by exclusively working with another veterinarian? Could they not, over time, receive both formalized education as well as on the job training and attain a, a, a level consistent with what makes a good veterinarian. And, and you could extrapolate this out to a whole bunch of other categories. I, I remember a real popular show for a while was Suits. And I remember watching this show and the whole premise with Suits is you got this guy with a photographic memory who just memorizes law books and understands it and is a highly effective lawyer. The one problem is he never went to law school. He'd, he'd taken the bar several times for several students that had gone to law school because they paid him to take the bar for him, right? But he had never gone to law school, so he couldn't legally operate as a lawyer. And there's this one federal you know, attorney that is just going after that. He needs to go to jail. He practiced law without a license. He, was he bad at it? No, actually, he was one of the best in the firm. 
So let me get this straight. He was fully capable of actually doing everything that was necessary to be a lawyer, but he didn't have his government permission slip, and so now he can't? This is the sort of thing, and again, regardless of where you stand on licensing requirements, stuff like that, regardless of where you stand, it's about time we start asking more fundamental questions when it comes to our education system. Because I'm tired of hearing, I've got a degree. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. In fact, the more letters you have after your name, PhD, the more skeptical I become in some cases, depending on what the subject matter was. What I really want to know is, what can you do? What are you capable of? Now, it could be that the degree actually equipped you with those capabilities, that the experience that you received through a formal education equipped you for those things, in which case, great. But what's important to understand is that it's the capabilities, ultimately, that are providing you the economic success, not the fact that you got a degree. The degree should mean the capabilities exist. But do any of us feel fully confident that that's what a degree means anymore? No. I went to, I went to you know undergrad for three and a half years. I graduated early. Um, I, I think I've learned more from watching YouTube videos than I did three and a half years of undergrad. Um, and I majored Same. in poli sci with a minor in history. I, I know for a fact that I know more from working with Nick on the political side and just watching YouTube videos or reading books on the history side than I learned from three and a half years of, in retrospect, my degree was worthless. I, if, if I could trade my degree back for all the money for it, I, I would do it easily, easily. I don't, I don't need yeah. the degree for what I yeah. do for a living. Well, and this is, but here's what, here's what we'll say. Everyone at this table agrees that education is incredibly important. Absolutely. What we're skeptical of is whether or not the institutions that would have previously been it. trusted with this, this sacred task have actually done a good job on it. And I think what most of us would come to the conclusion of is that in some cases they do, in a lot of cases they don't, and they've become incredibly expensive. And the way that they've subsidized that expense is by taking money through tax dollars, right? Or by creating licensure requirements, which says you must go to them if you want to actually provide the service that you would like to provide. It's no longer up to the customers whether or not you can provide it to them. The university now has a grip on whether or not you can perform this tax because the government has given them that grip. I think, and we're already seeing this, there used to be certain industries that they only hired, not only did they, they only hire people with degrees, they only hired people with degrees from certain institutions, and they are now rethinking that because what they've realized is what they're hiring is activists, not capable people when it comes to the job they need performed. And what this provides for conservatives is an incredible opportunity to kind of rewrite the narrative on what does a good education look like. And that can start within the private sector, within homeschooling. It starts with elementary school, high school. I tell people this all the time. I think we're going to be fascinated to find out that so many of the things that we classified as disorders were disorders in large part, not because they're inherent disorders, but because they were different capabilities that couldn't manifest themselves in a positive light in a system which says, sit down, shut up for the next six hours and read this book. What, I, what I've noticed about people that struggle with things like ADD or ADHD, you give them a complex task under the gun and give them the freedom to actually address it the way that they want to as opposed to the way that they're told, and it is amazing what they can accomplish in a relatively short period of time with very little instruction. That's not true of everybody, but I've noticed it. And so I wonder... I wonder how many things that we've classified. Now, look, there are times we need to sit down, shut up, and read the book, right? And that's usually, that's usually solved by a quick uh, display of a little bit of discipline. But there's other times where it's like, no, we are, we are actually we're, we're harnessing something and we're making it into a bad trait because it doesn't work in the system that we've crammed them into. Right. And, and we got a whole generation of kids that thinking they're bad or they're bad learners or they're stupid or they're just they don't fit in. When in reality is that we change the mechanism for where they're operating and we gave them different tasks to solve and we allowed them more freedom to solve it. We might find that the thing that we thought was a disorder was actually an advantage under different circumstances. And I think that's an, at least important to consider. And we have the we as as coming up with alternative institutions and alternative responses to these challenges have an opportunity to test that. I think that's important. All right, let's look at let's take one more institution for today on whether or not we need to save it with from within alternative or just. So we've talked about education. We've talked about academia. We've talked Hollywood, about Hollywood. Government. Do 
do we want to talk about maybe on the finance side of things, the economic side? Yes, of things? let's talk about the economic side. So, I feel like that this is this is a little bit more complex because you can't say. I mean, I guess you could say we're gonna we're gonna set up our own stock exchange and we're gonna set up our <laughs> own banks. You know, yeah. Conserva Bank, yeah. <laughs> Liberty Bank, Freedom, Freedom Bank. Bank. <laughs> Get your Freedom Gold and Freedom Bank. Invest now. <laughs> but, um, but I will say this. You can use competing currencies. Oh, you're talking about cryptos. I mean, this. so, so um, uh, Mille, I think, is the guy's name in Argentina that's running for president there, like the hardcore Austrian libertarian that's like, potentially might actually win the presidential election. He's talked about um, that he wants to abolish the central bank in Argentina and remove all the currency controls, um, the capital controls that, that basically limit what type of currency people can engage in. And, and, and his message to people is if, if he wins, he wants a society in Argentina where you can trade in whatever currency you want, yeah. as long as the person that you're trading with will accept it. And I, I do think that, when we've one of the first things we brought up in this podcast was the looming sovereign debt crisis, and we've done separate podcasts before about why the dollar will inevitably collapse. So, what would you recommend on this? So, I, I'm never going to recommend go buy freedom yeah, gold. Yeah, go buy Bitcoin. Yeah, go right? buy like, Bitcoin. Yeah. I will say this: I own some Bitcoin. Sure. And I own some Ethereum myself. And and for myself, I I I want to hedge my bets and make sure that I don't have all my eggs in Uncle Sam's basket when it comes to the U.S. dollar. Yeah. And I will say this, too. Engaging in currencies, whatever it is, it could be Dogecoin for all it matters. Like, yeah. like the, the, the point is, is that engaging in currencies that that don't have, you know, that 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 can, that level of control from the federal government or any of these left-wing ideological groups, right? That, that again, we've talked about like some of the ESG stuff that yeah. Wall Street's pushing. We already know how woke Silicon Valley is, right? Like, Working outside of that system, I actually do think it's possible to some degree to build counter institutions, even when it comes to things like finance and economics. Now, some of these things you do just have to push back. So, for example, some of these southern states that are saying, no, we're going to debank from anybody. Our bank accounts, the government's yeah, bank accounts are pretty in large. Arkansas and Florida and <laughs> yeah. Texas and Louisiana, like we're not going to work with BlackRock. We're not going to, to put our retirement accounts and any sort of institution that pushes ESG nonsense. Yeah. I, I do think that from a government perspective, state governments, conservative state governments doing that is a must. So this is this is one of these fields where I don't think it's it's walk away, and I don't think it's just build new institutions, yeah. and I don't think it's just tear down institutions. It's a combination well, of all I of think, them. I think that's a really good point, because in a lot of these things, that's what you're going to see. You're going to see kind of working things at, at different angles, and different people are going to be suited to different tasks, and it's about finding, finding your place in that. Now, I will say this on the economic, I think the currency is a really interesting one. I had a lot of conservatives that get mad at me when I did something on, on crypto once. And I said, look, I'm not telling you to do it. I, I'm telling you that a, a currency which is not controlled by a government is not a bad idea. I had some people that were actually Christians who were like, no, this is, you know, this is going to be like Mark of the Beast stuff. And I'm like, then you don't want a government controlled currency. Like this is like, like that's, this is, one of the ways that you can do business without the government controlling you know, the medium of exchange. I think another thing within the economy that's going to be important, and I think this is going to, this is going to, this is going to, this is going to be, where, where's, uh, where's Wandering Warrior at? Wandering Warrior. You're going to love this, man. The economy, again, when we look at licensure, when we look at regulations, one of the ways the government controls the economy is by telling who can do business and under what circumstances and conditions. I think we saw during COVID where people became a lot more comfortable with pushing the boundaries on that. And I think we're going to see more. I think that spirit still exists. And you know what? I'm here for it, baby. Like, I love it when people question, when adults, free grown human beings, adults question the idea of why can't I go to that person for medical care? You know, I, I've, I've used this analogy before. A special forces 18 Delta goes to two years or about a year and a half of very, very intensive medical training. And when they're overseas, they can deliver babies. They can do veterinarian work. They can do geriatric work. They're really good at trauma, right? Because 
one of the primary things they focus on is ER type work. Dude is shot. You're in the middle of a firefight. You've got to return fire. You got to save your buddy. You got to stop the bleeding. You got to call in a nine line medevac. You got to get him back to safety and then save their life. But poof, once you show up back in the United States, if you give a kid stitches for one tenth of what it costs you for an emergency room trip, you're now a criminal. That's stupid and it should be treated as such. And I want to see more people, I want to see more people finding ways to work within those gray areas of saying, I have a capability. You know I have a capability. You know that I'm not, I haven't gone through X, Y, and Z school. The government hasn't given me permission to be able to engage in this capability. But you trust that I can do it well, and you're willing to make that decision as an informed adult. Here's some money. I'd like this good or service. I love that. I can't wait for the left to be like, Delegate Freitas endorses black markets. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to end with this. I might put that on my business card. <laughs> also on the economic side, what we need to replicate what we did to Bud Light to other companies, other corporations. Yeah, yeah. There, there's been a lot of talk about new like mask mandates and lockdowns and stuff like that lately. The first company that tries to enforce this type of stuff, yeah. conservatives need to dogpile them yeah. and bankrupt them and send a message because for so long, the reason the reason the Leviathan is what it is on the uh, when it comes to the institutions related to finance and economics yeah. is because, quite frankly, so much of Wall Street and Silicon Valley has learned over time through, through reinforcement mechanisms that, you know what? We pay a deep price by crossing lines with the left and we pay no price yeah. for, for alienating conservatives. They need to learn to fear conservatives more than they currently fear alienating the most mentally ill demographic in America right now. Well, again, I, I go I go back to this idea that when we when we look at the economy in general, there's, there's always going to be things that you still have to interact with, that you still have to contend with, that you still have to... But... The more capabilities you've developed and the larger your network of people, this is why we talk about intentional communities so much, is because if you get to a point where there's serious economic circumstances, if you get to a point where the government decides, oh, we've got another pandemic and we're going to shut down the economy, the question you're going to have to ask yourself is, do I plan to shut down and who can I continue to do business with that is not going to decide that, well, I guess I'm just not critical anymore? Because the government arbitrarily decided. I loved it when the government said, you know what's critical? ABC stores, but not your church, not your small business, not your coffee shop. But the mechanism for which the government retained you know, revenue and alcohol beverage control shops, no, 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 that was critical and must, must remain open. Like That's the sort of stuff you should look at and be like, screw you, dude. You know another example? I'm not shutting down because of that. You know another example? What? This was the point of no return for me. Yeah. When in the summer of 2020, we talked about the Leviathan and, and how the left has, con you know, controls all these institutions. When it comes to, you know, trust the experts. I'm old enough to remember when the experts were signing letters saying, shut the country down, engage in brutal lockdowns that cost people their jobs and livelihoods and created many of the mental health crises that you're seeing right now, especially with business owners and children for that matter, shut the country down, except if you want to go out there and burn and loot and pillage cities in the name of BLM riots. Does anybody here in chat or maybe somebody listening to the podcast at home or driving, you probably remember seeing news stories in the summer of 2020 of health professionals and, and medical professionals and all the experts signing these letters saying, oh, we support the real pandemic is systemic racism. Yeah. We're going to shut the country down, shut down all the schools, shut down all the businesses, ban you from going to work. But if you want to go out there and loot and pillage yeah. and burn people's businesses down and destroy cars and property, oh, that... We endorse that yeah. as the medical community. That was the point of no return for me when it came to trust the experts. At that point, I decided, oh, okay, the experts are part of the Leviathan as well. Yeah. Now I say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna close this. Or you got a couple more? Uh, let me give a quick shout out to yeah. Andy K on Rumble for what I believe is called a rant. On oh, Rumble. nice. Uh, we don't have enough people doing trade jobs anymore. 
think we would agree with no, that. No, no, absolutely. Well, and, and you you see that, and and again, it's it, one of the reasons why is because I believe we've we've kind of disincentivized it within our our primary levels of education. We almost treat it as, and parents feel this. They almost feel like if their kid isn't going to college, because that's the question you ask. Oh, your kid's graduating high school. Where are they going to college? And you feel obligated to say something or make an excuse if they're not. No, I, I'm. I want my kids to do the things that are going to, to make them economically viable and make them happy with respect to their profession. That's what I want for my kids. And I'm proud when they find it. And, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit there and brag. Oh yes. My kid is <laughs> racking up $60,000 a year for a gender studies degree at Cal Berkeley. So they'll be moving in again shortly, right? Like that is, are you supposed to be proud of that? No, <laughs> no. Like, you know, focus on something that actually provides your kid capability and the ability to provide for their family. Again, I hate that. Like, it's not, it's, it's about a well-rounded individual. A well-rounded individual can pay their own bills. How about that? All right, let's kind of wrap this up. So we've talked about a lot of things today. And, and again, I get really excited when we talk about the alternatives, the ways that we can actually push back about certain things without asking government permission. And, and again, starts with the individual. Work on what do you believe? Like, what, what is the foundation of your worldview? And if that foundation of the worldview doesn't provide you a platform to understand your own identity and your own responsibilities associated with that morally, socially, individually, right? And then develop the capabilities, develop the intellectual capabilities, the physical capabilities. That way, when you enter into that next rung of society, which is just social environments, your family, your friends, your larger community, your state, your country, right? You're able to effectively interact in economic ways and social ways. And then we talked about what are some of the institutions we've got to fight for? And what are some of the institutions we need to start looking at alternatives and how do you do that? And I hope we equipped you with, with some knowledge here on, on maybe some things you didn't consider before on how you can push back on arts and entertainment, what happens when you shut off at a particular point in a movie and those streaming services know exactly what you did, what happens when you develop those capabilities, and, and I think most importantly, those intentional communities. Because when things start to get bad or when the government decides to get especially obnoxious, that provides you that network built in to not just rely upon for charity but to actually be able to feed into and to be able to provide exchange in what genuine community was supposed to be. People living together in voluntary cooperation with one another, working together when it made sense, leaving each other alone when it didn't, and resisting that urge to compel everyone to do what you want. The, the empowered individual who knows who they are, who is secure in their identity, doesn't look at the bad things that happen as, as just, just nothing more than grave cosmic injustices that they can't do anything about and must go find a politician to fight their battles for them. They see them as natural challenges that take place. They understand what their role and responsibility is to meet those challenges. They look for opportunities, not just problems. They display gratitude, not just grievance. And in the end, are the sort of people that actually save civilization. So, be that sort of person. We're certainly trying to be and will continue to try to improve ourselves to make sure that we can be that person and we would love to be able to further connect with those people, which is why I would ask you all to consider joining our community chat all right, you can go over there. We have the links for it in there. We actually, this episode, this episode came as a result of people That's on right. our community chat asking for us to talk about alternatives. Like the left says, this is the way that we address the problems. What do we say is the way to address those problems? And I hope we did a pretty good job of answering that question. And once again, I just want to thank Good Ranchers for, for being able to sponsor this program and to be able to provide value to the people that watch this program. Because again, if you go in, you get that link, that promo code, that promo code Nick, that's going to get you $25 off. That's going to get you free shipping. If you sign up for one of the subscriptions, you can get locked into a good price plus two pounds of free ground beef. It is quality product. Like we've said before, we are never going to push products on our audience that we don't personally believe in. And we went through a long process of ordering different things from them, trying it out, making sure that it was something that we liked. Christian's come up with like four different Buffalo Mac recipes oh, based off of their chicken. Oh, we bought it. Paid yeah. for, oh, no, for we it did ourselves. Too. We paid for it ourselves too to make sure that this was a product that we liked. So we really appreciate the fact that they, they do provide a good service. They're not just trying to get you to do business with them based off of patriotism or conservatism. They're providing you a quality product. And if you're going to put the American flag on something, and if you're going to put patriotism on something, and if you're going to make conservative, you're going to make all that a part of your brand, then quality better be coming out the other end. And Good Ranchers does a really <laughs> good job with that. So... We want you to go to Good Ranches. Check out that link. We thank you for what they do for the store. Thank you all for your comments, for watching, for the suggestions you give us on the community chat. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it. I promise 
Queen of Beans, the the Queen of the Beans. You just I said Queen, queen of, beans of Beans again. Beans? I'm talking too quick. I promise. The Queen of the Bees, who you all love more than anybody else on this show, which hurts a little to be honest, but I get it. I love her more than anybody else on this show as well. Sorry, guys. I promise you we'll be back soon. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we will see you next episode.